There's no place to escape to. This is the last time. Oh, yes. On the left. <laughs> That's when the cannibalism started. Here we go. So right now, you may be stranded on the side of the road because, <laughs> let's face it, you're a bad driver. Whoa. Or you may be looking at your home, your village, your town, burnt to the ground by vile protesters. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> but oh. don't you wish that you okay. could do something about it? Don't you wish that there was someone there to handle it? Yeah. To take care of it. I do wish there was someone to handle it and take care of it. I'm feeling really down. <laughs> curious, I see you are. I'm pretty curious. I'm mm. feeling pretty sad. Yeah, that's very good. Oh, I have nowhere to go. Nowhere to go. Perfect. <laughs> and we have just the six foot seven, 330 pound empty space. <laughs> yeah. For the Whoa. perfect. That's my size. <laughs> yeah. Welcome aboard, Clam. Whoa! <laughs> he was the right amount of curious. Uh, yeah. yeah. Mm, curious. Curious. Welcome to the last podcast of the left, everyone. Curious Ben here with Marcus <laughs> and Henry. Oh, we're st- oh, you're curious, Ben. Yeah, yes, you got, so indeed. you're settling in with curious Ben. I like curious Ben. If I see a tree, I shake it and try to figure <laughs> out what's going to fall out. Sometimes it's a cat. Sometimes it's a squirrel. Sometimes it's a lemon. Sometimes <laughs> I just want to see what she looks like. With no clothes on. Curious, Ben. <laughs> I'm a bit curious. It seems the area between my pockets is the most curious <laughs> part of Ben. Well, that's a little offensive. <laughs> All right, everyone. Today's episode and a series of episodes to follow. We're covering David Miss Cavage, of course, of Scientology fame. Yeah, coming for you, you tiny bitch. Whoa! <laughs> yeah, no, man. you guys are the exact same height. No, I no? tower over this dude. Do he you? Has, he, David Miscavige is so towers, short. It towers I very. I tower yeah, but... <laughs> over this guy. David yeah. Miscavige is so short. How, How short, short is he? He has to go up on his wife. <laughs> Who's dead? <laughs> He's dead in Big Bear. <laughs> I accept it. I love it. And I'm in. Now, when we did our series on Scientology founder L. Ron Hubbard six or so years ago, we ended it somewhat abruptly with his death in 1986, mostly because what came next in the story of Scientology was far too large to broach. Yeah, hmm. apparently it's another three-episode series worth of information. Yes. See, after L. Ron Hubbard died, he was succeeded by a 25-year-old goblin with an incredible amount of energy who, through a brilliant series of highly calculated corporate moves, had positioned himself to weasel his way into the top spot despite the fact that he was a relative unknown amongst the rank and file at the time. Okay. Sometimes it's about heat. It's what takes you to the top. Look at the Spotify ranks. Comes down to (laughs) Dr. Greg Almond. He's the number two podcast on in the world uh-huh. right now. He's doing a lot of great anal research right now. <laughs> anal play. Oh. This goblin's name is David Miscavige. Oh, shit. And don't you fucking forget it. Yeah. And he's now actually been the top man at Scientology for far longer than L. Ron Hubbard was ever in charge. We wow. realized that. We did the math as we were doing the production call. And, you know, because it's all LRH, LRH, because, again, he's the heart and soul. Mm-hmm. He's the adventure and romance. Mm-hmm. He's the creator of it all. He's the body. Yes. The sex of <laughs> sure, Scientology. yes. But uh, David Miscavige, he gets in there and he really just tears it the fuck up. Yeah. Yes, he is the human equivalent of a mouse in a ser- around a series of elephants, and it makes the elephants go all crazy. But it shows he's the one extended. He's the I think we ca- calculated it was like thirty one years that LRH was in charge, and mm. now he's at close to thirty five. Wow! Yeah. Well, Miss Cavage is the man who made his religion a force to be reckoned with in Hollywood. The man who took a cue from Catholicism and turned Scientology into a real estate empire. But most importantly. He was the man who secured tax exempt status Yay! for Scientology. Yay! Mm-hmm. But when do we get it? <laughs> you have to start your church already. Yeah. My Thought Academy. <laughs> it has to be called a church or you don't get tax exemption. Yes. Church of Thought Academy. I'm a deacon. <laughs> But David Miscavige is also the man who let this incredibly powerful organization get to the point where they could be chipped away at and taken down by South Park, Stacy from Say by the Bell, oh, wow. and fucking 4chan. 
Because nice. if you'll all remember the first real target of the so-called Hacker Collective Anonymous, it was Scientology. Yep. And that was the fir- really the first time that Scientology mm. really wobbled was when 4chan went after him hard. But to be fair, when it comes to the Scientology episode of South Park, South Park did have some ramifications. Yes. Chef left. Yeah. Isaac Hayes. It was like the only time other than Muhammad episode, which was a little controversial as well. But it was the only time where the guys actually had some blowback from within. Mm-hmm. And, and Nancy Cartwright also was a, who's a voice for the Simpsons. She's Bart Simpson. She's like she's a famous Scientologist yeah. and has famously ixnayed several episodes of the Simpsons that had some form of Scientology joke within that she would not participate in Mm -hmm. because she knew she'd have to go through a hell of a rundown. Yeah. Mm. She actually came and spoke at Texas Tech when I was in college in the early 2000s. And afterwards, she came down to speak to everyone, was very nice, but she had a big fat stack of Scientology pamphlets with her. What, do you mean something like this? (laughs) You guys can't see it home. No. I have. That's a huge book. Feel how heavy this book is. Jesus. I seriously feel how heavy this fucking book is. This is the entire class five Scientology handbook I have. And guess what I'm doing today? I don't know. You can not read it. Our precious audience is going to learn a lot about David Miscavige, mm-hmm. but I'm going to heal Marcus <laughs> with Scientological. <laughs> this, touch this. Give me this. Give me this for one no. second before we get into this. Touch this. Look how big this thing is. It is a it is a collection of every single piece of tech that you can get from a class five, like kind of te- It's for volunteer ministers. Uh, volunteer ministers. Which means, guess what? Not getting paid. Oh, great. Well, you're a volunteer. Congrats. Yeah, you're a volunteer who has to pay for the materials yes. that you use to volunteer. I have the privilege to paying for the material because <laughs> then I have the privilege to go teach it for free. <laughs> this is the most asinine view of drug use I have no, ever yeah, seen. They have a whole thing with drug. There's a section where it shows a guy doing cocaine with a full fountain drink straw, <laughs> <laughs> which I guess is very hygienic. Very I much guess so. Yeah, so. you don't want to get too close to the table. All right. Well, today, David Miscavige is a man with enemies on all sides, desperately trying to deflect questions about the decades-long disappearance of his wife while coming out of hiding only to film commercials, showing off his admittedly fantastic new hair plugs. Ooh. Yeah, he looks like a kind of like, you know, those old commercials for batteries that have the plastic people. Yeah, yeah. The, the, the Energizer people. Yeah. yeah, he looks like that. It's very nice. Yeah, yeah. they look like that Primus video for uh, somebody's beaver. Why known as Big Brown Beaver. Now, despite their shrinking influence, Scientology is still a well-funded organization, as is evidenced by the two Super Bowl ads they aired just this previous Sunday. Curious. That, by the way, was the 11th consecutive Super Bowl that the church has had enough money to purchase at least one spot. Now, I I am going to just do a little bit of pushback. Gutfeld also had two. Yes. <laughs> okay, cat temp, good, good on you, cat. But Gutfeld had two commercials. Also, they might not be as expensive as they were. Uh, there's no way. They, they, I'm, like I'm seven certain, million dollars. Well, What's it seven million for those ads? Well, it dude, depends Gutfeld on is, dude. What the fuck are you talking about? Gutfeld is on fucking Fox News. The Super Bowl is on Fox. Gutfeld. <laughs> yeah, they probably cut him a break. And also, I, I believe most spots are between. They are between two and seven. It depends on where in the game they they air. It was an interesting smattering of Jesus, Scientology, and gut filled. <laughs> but I'm just, but the M&Ms are back. Yeah. yeah. I want to fuck each one of them in their little mouths. <laughs> oh, that's the only place to do it. Yep. <laughs> no, unless you crack open the shell. No, no, and then no. You, that's where their pussies and their dicks are. Oh, inside of it. Stop that's true. It. That's true. I mean, I did show you guys that picture of that naked in M M&M last week, and it did have breasts and a vagina. Extremely. No pubic hair though. Not a single bit of pubic hair on that okay. M M&M. M. And I thought that was brave. And but I will <laughs> yes. say that the M M&M M did have boobies that we all recognized. Do you know what I mean? Yes. Of course, David Miscavige. <laughs> Here we go. Well, from what we know, the longer Miscavige is in charge, the more membership numbers crater. Hmm. He is, put simply, a weirdo, a manic frat boy bully, a sharp toothed little boy with ADHD who is both confusing and cruel with his insults and punishments. He's like that kid from that episode of King of the Hill, the dusty old bones full of green oh, dust kid, yeah. the one that keeps bullying Hank and riding around <laughs> on his fucking lawn yeah. over and over, dusty old bones full of green dust. That's David Miscavige. But the thing is, it's a really effective way to just devastate the human mind. Of yes. course, if you, it, it's a, it truly is a Scientological trick. Like the yes. idea of saying to you, a nonsense calling you a clam. 
<laughs> and then everyone laughing, right? Everyone be like, yeah, sure, for a clam. And they're like, what does it mean? What do you like, mean? Yeah. It, it's, it, it's weird. They say a thing to you that makes no sense to you, but they're all laughing like you just got burned out of your fucking shoes. Well, the follow-up <laughs> is, why? how am I a clam? I don't want to be a clam. Yeah. And then you have to move on to unclamming yourself. <laughs> Excellent. Shucking. Shucking. It's called shucking. <laughs> Well, Miscavige is the man who introduced physical pain and torture to the world of Scientology. Whereas in the days of L. Ron Hubbard, it was more about control and money. Yes, it was predatory. Of course it was. But it wasn't that physical. LRH, I mean, again, truly, like, I'll strip away some of my ironic love of LRH. I do understand he was a difficult man. Bad person. Bad Piece person. Of shit. Bad guy. Con man. Thief. And right. all of this shit. But within him, creator do, of a religion, creator of a religion. <laughs> yeah, so. yeah. But there's a part of me that like, like I know for a fact that yes, LRH like control, but really what LRH really liked was his uniform and he liked his hat and he his liked, corgis. He loved his corgis. He loved being on his boat. He loved everybody calling him sir, even though he, he was bad at everything. He loved right. all the trappings of being the leader where, and then he kind of was like truly very kind of introspective and thought that like, Oh, maybe in some way I believe in all of this that I'm talking about. And I can kind of tech my own way out of this. I can figure yeah. out how to do this. But David Miscavige was uh, his violent hand like a mm -hmm. dying LRH had violence in his heart and it reached out and it chose David Miscavige mm. and then David Miscavige became the fucking slapping hand of Scientology. So L. Ron Hubbard is still responsible for his own creation Utterly. of Scientology yeah. and Utterly. Miscavige. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And say what you will about L. Ron Hubbard but the man certainly had what you'd call an adventurous spirit. Yeah. I think that that's safe to say. Yeah, yeah. an eater's mouth and body. He did. <laughs> But the difference between Hubbard and Miscavige is that Hubbard is, at his core, he's a romantic. As Henry was saying, he loves his little boats. He loves the adventure of everything. Miscavige, he doesn't have a fucking ounce of poetry in his soul. No. David Miscavige came into Scientology playing an entirely different game than everyone else. Miscavige was playing the corporate game, and he turned Scientology into a reflection of his own character. But really, the main question that we're wanting to answer with this series is... How does a cult survive the death of its founder? Put another way, it's sort of like a band losing its lead singer. It's like how Joy Division became New Order after Ian Curtis died. But would you not say that some people like New Order more than Joy Division? Yeah, and some people like David Miscavige more than they liked L. Ron Hubbard. Some people like Foo Fighters more than Nirvana. That's Who right. are those people? <laughs> a lot of people. I mean, I like them both, but... Yeah. David Letterman's favorite uh, musician is Warren Zevon. Followed by Foo Fighters. And he's got his finger on the pulse of everything that's in the now right now. The kids love David Letterman. Uh, they can't get enough. Yeah. But just as the tensions that existed in Joy Division became magnified after the death of Ian Curtis until Peter Hook was eventually and wrongfully forced out of New Order. Does anyone know what he's talking about? Does anyone know? I know because I listened to this series, but yes, it's, okay. this is Marcus's agenda. Okay. So too did Scientology take on a different tone after Elrond was dead. Speaking of a change in tone, when it comes to Scientology defectors, there are basically two camps. There are those who say that Scientology always has been and always will be a scam. Hmm. That's one camp. Sure. But a scam that you like, that's just a game. Yes. And then, or if it's your lifestyle, and that's you and you like it, but it's still a scam. Yeah, it's still a scam. You're still paying through the nose to play this game. Sure. But then there are those who still believe, even after they've left the church, that Scientology is real. They just believe that Miss Cavage came in and perverted L. Ron Hubbard's vision. Well, it's because they didn't go through the goddamn handbook and don't understand <laughs> that it's about touching knees. Mm -hmm. And then if you, I did a, read a whole thing and I'm going to work, do this with you. I want to try do. this. Please where, do. Please do. How you can make somebody sober using Scientological like let's, tactics. Let's do it. All yeah. right. Because you showed up, you showed up hammered. I saw how you drove. Oh yeah. I'm, I'm absolutely <laughs> hammered. Absolutely. Look at the liquid death. Uh-huh. Look at the liquid death. Yes. Look at the liquid death. Yes. Look at the liquid death. Yes. <laughs> Look at the Waterloo. Look at the Waterloo. Okay. No, you haven't moved. Look at the fucking Waterloo. I'm looking at it. Say yes. Yeah. Look at the liquid death. Yeah. Are you sober? No. Ah, I gotta keep doing it until you're sober. <laughs> oh. That is literally what you're supposed to do. Yeah. Well, it definitely could put you in a different kind of mind funk, a sort of focus, perhaps. Yeah. You could also just lie and say, yes, I'm now sober. Yep. I mean, that's kind of the game. And then you find out whether or not you believe the lie. And guess what? You just got Scientology. All yeah. right. But no matter their philosophy, the people who have left Scientology over the last few decades have been incredibly vocal. And we therefore have an abundance of sources when it comes to figuring out just who David Miscavige is 
and how Scientology has gotten to the point that it now finds itself in 2023. Most helpful in this have been the books Going Clear by Lawrence Wright, a classic in the cult genre, and A Billion Years by Mike Rinder, the latter of which being the most harrowing because it was written by a former member of Scientology's inner circle. And there's also a real, I got some good information from Beyond Belief by Jenna Miscavige, who is David Miscavige's niece. And there's a little bit of kind of understanding, a little more context in the two. It's mm-hmm. There's a lot of fucking sources. Yeah. It's just interesting to remind ourselves they all have families. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. You know, he's just somebody's uncle. Oh, no. They somebody's t- kid. She just yeah. calls him Uncle Dave. Right. The whole thing, like, well, I can't believe that Uncle Dave would allow me to be doing manual labor in a desert mm-hmm. in California. And it's just like, I don't think he's Uncle Dave anymore. No, no he's he's a screaming psychopath. But for the early years of David Miscavige's life, we have no choice but to mostly rely on the words of his father, Ron Miscavige, mm. who co-wrote a wobbly takedown of his own son called Ruthless. And that's where we'll begin our journey today. Yeah, I still don't like any father who writes a a, a, a what a, a diss book about their children. Yeah, I just don't like it when no. when parents take down he, their kids, even if their kids are horrible. You created the motherfucker. He's such a absolute. I'm just gonna go and just. I mean, whatever. He, I, we do believe here in the concept of rehabilitation. Yes, right? we do. We do believe at some point you should be able to work yourself out of the sins that you've done in this life so that you could move on and change and grow. Sure. Yeah. Otherwise, Ron, why would anyone change and grow ever. if there's no there forgiveness? If there's no forgiveness. But Ron Miscavige is a dumb piece of shit. Okay. <laughs> and if you read this book, right, like a ruthless is just sounds like a cut from Grover's Corners. Like it's just like, <laughs> I'm just a small town Scientologist. But it's the way he covers his own son is interesting because he doesn't go whole hog no. into ripping him to pieces. So Ron because if is he a does, Scientologist. Yes, Ron yes. is what started the whole thing because gotcha. Ron, all he wanted to do was play the fucking trumpet. Okay. And there was from, <laughs> I'm from Mount Carmel. And it's called Mount Carmel. Yeah. And the pronunciation's with the car up front. It's not Mark Carmel. This isn't a town made out of candy. Okay. <laughs> it's called Mount Carmel. Carmel. Right? And it was a... It was a mining town. People were hard workers, the most worked in the coal mines. The town was like a little Europe. My family was Polish, <laughs> but there was also Slovaks, Italians, Irish, Germans. Truly a potpourri of humanity. Mm, I'm Fo- sure it smelled just like potpourri. <laughs> Football was king. People lived and died by the fortunes of the high school team. That's healthy. If yeah. you were on the Mount Carmel football team, you could do no wrong. You could be caught robbing a store. What is the point of all this? And the cop would scold the <laughs> store owner for reporting you. Now, on Friday nights in the fall. What is the point of the this? The band and the cheerleaders that marked down 3rd Street from the high school to the stadium. And the down <laughs> turned out to cheer them on Yay. and follow in by. Sure, Nothing yeah. else to do. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and after the game, oh, people would head down to Matucci's. Matucci's. Head to bar and restaurant. Matucci's, was that some sort of sign? Scientology stronghold? Is no, that why you're no, reading all this? No, Is that no. why we're going through all That's this? That's where we got our pretzels. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but the thing is, you remember when you're in this town, now next to football, the only other thing that people in Mount Carmel respected was music. Scientology. No, music. Music. <laughs> See, if a minor saw a kid who plotted, played an instrument being picked on, he'd say, hey, lay off that kid. He's a musician. I think that's a lie by Ron Miscavige <laughs> because he played music and was picked on and wished that someone would defend him. And what you none of you understand is that was life in the coal region. The values I grew up with and what I wanted to instill in my own children. And for three of the four, I think it worked out pretty well. well so the values <laughs> were... That is word for word the value, okay, Three the out of the four. Three, three, yes, number four was one of the most dangerous cult leaders that, all to, time. to all time that ever exists. But three out of the four, and they just turned out pretty well. 75% of my kids are not hyper-dangerous international felons. <laughs> what do you want me to do, what do you father want me? of the year? Me? Also, I don't know what morality tale he was trying to spin because it sounds like they're preying on teenagers yeah, yeah, yeah. trying to live their lives through their eyes once again and and then inevitably the teenagers become the coal miners and then they watch all the other kids play football and then it's a vicious cycle of alcoholism and sadness. No, yeah. you mean the American dream. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> David Miscavige was a twin born April 30th, 1960. Whoa. Yeah. We're both Tauruses. Wow. Good job. Moving on. <laughs> <laughs> he was born to Loretta and Ron Miscavige in the suburbs of New Jersey. Loretta was a recent nursing school graduate, and Ron was a Marine vet turned cookware salesman. Regular middle class family. Sure. Yep. But while most people handled the middle class struggle with a plum, Ron was physically abusive towards his wife on a regular basis. And that comes from Ron. How dare you say that? That is called aggressive learning. 
<laughs> that I was taught in the Marines. Yeah. That's what he said. He said he ran his family like it was in the Marines. And Great. yes, yes, it might have been harsh at times. Mm-hmm. Sure. Right. But I, once you're a Marine, you're always Marine, mm-hmm. especially when you're having sex with your wife. Well, number one, you were in the Navy, so we can kind of make fun of you for that. And second of all, your wife is a nurse and you sell cookware. So maybe you're not the, the brains of the operation. <laughs> I'll kill anybody within five feet. Oh, you are more violent, though, I see. Well, Ron only partly takes responsibility for his abusive nature as an influence on his son's violent personality. Instead, Ron said... There must be something in David's DNA mm. that makes him a dominating, vol- vindictive psychopath. Um, does he not take any responsibility for that? Nope. No, because absolutely not. Because he you probably know, should. He's no. only half of it. Yeah, come on, man. Three out of the four. Totally Nailed fine. It. <laughs> it's not baseball. <laughs> he's batting .75, man. I mean, that's phenomenal. <laughs> it is. But when David Miskovich was a boy... He was mostly defined by his extreme asthma, which is what brought the Miscavige family to Scientology. See, Ron Miscavige was what you'd call a born sucker. Me? No. (laughs) I was a Marine until I was, I literally was born a Marine. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yep. He'd gotten pulled into a pyramid scheme called Holiday Magic that sold fruit-scented cosmetics and distributed leaflets that said that Avon salespeople, they're nothing more than goon squads. Yeah, man. You know how those Avon salespeople are? (laughs) They need to be rounded up and put into camps. So he was even dumber than the Avon people. Yes. Well, he he said that, like, it seemed like a no-brainer. Some people said it was a pyramid scheme, but I just said it was an idea that didn't properly take off. Uh, Holiday magic? It is now taught in criminal justice courses as the most obvious pyramid <laughs> yes. scheme in modern history. There's a That's lot of people say, I say it's more of a square business. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Holiday magic. Holiday magic, yeah. And they smell, and they sell scented makeup. Fruit scented makeup. Cosmetics. Ugh. This one makes you smell like a cucumber, Barbara. This is really nice. Oh, yeah. Oh, you're really on that time of the month. You're going to want to smell like a pineapple. Oh, Barbara, <laughs> I guess you must have used all that makeup that makes you smell like another man's cum. Mm. <laughs> oh, this is amazing. Wow. This is it's no. almost like it is cum. <laughs> That's just the mango. Mm-mm. Well, what's interesting about Holiday Magic is that it was founded by the co-owner of a company called Mind Dynamics. Oh. Mind Dynamics was an encounter group that was a part of the so-called consciousness transformation movement, and their techniques of visualization and meditation have been closely compared to Amway, Est, and of course, Scientology. Oh, yeah. Sweet. My parents did a thing called KM, which was a a very bad pyramid scheme that they were selling a nutritious liquid and it tasted very, very bad. And we just had boxes and boxes and boxes of that at our house. My parents even got a license plate that said KM's great. Oh God, nutritious liquid. It was really (laughs) bad. It was so, if anyone knows about KM, reach out because it was uh, was isolated. (laughs) Yeah. Right in the Midwest. I don't know what the hell it was. Now, Ron Miscavige got immediately taken in by Holiday Magic's promise of an annual $100,000 return on fruits and cosmetics. Oh, yeah. You get $100,000 annual. He got a straight, he got that straight pitch and he's just like, they were like, a woman he met at a gas station (laughs) said straight up, how would you like to make another $100,000 a year? And he's like, absolutely. (laughs) Sign me up. Just immediately. Oh, my God. What a goober. Well, him and three other, quote, distributors for formed a, quote, corporate team <laughs> that regularly hosted, quote, opportunity meetings. It's no. more of a triangle-shaped <laughs> circumstance. <laughs> See, this is like we live in the era of influencers, and yeah, that can be annoying, but this is the OG influencer. Yeah. This is worse. You actually had to go to their house Eat out of their shitty Tupperware oh, yeah. my mom before was a- you realize that you were just in way over your head and about to get scabbed. And the only way to get out is to mark a little box on a magazine and oh, say, yeah. okay, mm-hmm. I'll buy it. My mom was an Avon Goon Squad member. <laughs> and I remember the piles of Avon sitting at the house. And yep. I remember my mom being like, these bitches don't know what look good. Like, they are just immediately, <laughs> yeah, like, man. she's got all this shit she's got to move. It's and so much <laughs> stress they put on their on their uh, personnel. Yeah. I mean, Holiday Magic was one of those pyramid schemes that truly was based completely on getting other people yeah. to buy into your uh, network. A no-brainer. Th- yeah. A no-brainer. Mm-hmm. Rise from your grave. 
This time of year, everyone's talking about making big changes, but sometimes the smallest changes to your routine can make the biggest impact, and you don't have to break the bank to make a big deal purchase. Even the smallest things can be a part of a big change if it's something you use every day. Like Raycons, whether you're looking for a pair of everyday earbuds, low latency gaming headphones, or a speaker with a battery that will last all night at your next party, Raycons got you covered. They offer buy now, pay later options, and every purchase has an easy and free return guarantee. I love Raycons when we travel for live shows, helps me listen to my favorite tunes, and pass the time on those long, long flights. Ready to buy something small with a big impact? Go to buyraycon.com slash last today to get 15% off your Raycon order. That's buyraycon.com slash last to score 15% off buyraycon.com slash last. Well, at one of these opportunity meetings in the year of 1969, Ron overheard a conversation being had by a fellow distributor named Mike Hess. Hess said that he got involved in holiday magic because as a Scientologist, he believed in experiencing everything, as all Scientologists believe. And by everything, he means everything. Including getting scammed in a pyramid scheme? Yes. 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 You don't need to experience that. (laughs) But you need to if you want to be a Scientologist. Okay. Well, after overhearing this statement, Ron was, in a word, curious. Curious. (laughs) Using classic, vague cult speak, Mike Hess told Ron that Scientology was about helping people become more able in life. Don't you want to be (laughs) morable? Morable. Yes, I do want to be morable. (laughs) Taking it a step further, Mike said that Scientology was more than just a philosophy. It's more than just a philosophy, friend. What is it? It offers practical solutions to real world problems. It's that easy. All you have to do is... Spend $175 on this 1,000-page handbook. Mm -hmm. This this is a no-brainer. Yeah. Hess claimed that if Ron became a Scientologist, never going to have to take another aspirin again. (laughs) Never Never going to have to take an aspirin. Never take an aspirin again. (laughs) Never do it. (laughs) Real-world problems. (laughs) That is a no-brainer. And when Ron said, tell me more, Mike said that the next time you get a headache, Ron, here's what you're going to do. Okay. You're going to look in the mirror. Yes. And you're going to give the guy in the mirror... Your headache. Give that guy your headache. That's me. No. <laughs> That's the guy in the mirror. Because it's really about the fact that your thoughts are, okay, let's, let's put it yeah. this way. Let, let's say, give me your, your cups, all right? Let me give you your many liquids. Here's you got your cup. water burger. You, want, you got what a water burger. You want my rock star? Give me your rock star and give me your liquid death and your water burger, okay. your cup here, all right? Yeah, so this all is you. That's all your liquids. These are my liquids. Yeah, he, just, liquid. he, just tricked, he just tricked you into giving him all They're of mine. your liquids. They're mine. So welcome to Scientology. <laughs> all your stuff is not mine. <laughs> um, but no, here we go. So your liquid death, as always. Yes, my right? little, my your little drink. That's my little water to help the rock star go down. Your feelings about, what are your feelings about the winners of the Super Bowl? Like, what are your feelings about it? I'm fine with it. It doesn't matter what the content are. And so, yeah, I ask you and I fuck with you. Right, but that's again, I hear good. Go to here. Your thoughts are your rockstar drink. Okay. But guess what the real world is? Hyper. Guess what? This is your thoughts. You're separate from you. This is you, and that's you, right? This is you. But your thoughts are over here. That's over here. That's rockstar, different liquid. But this separate concoction liquid, that's all of them, which is disgusting. I'm just going to imagine it's water. (laughs) Yeah. This, that's reality. That's messed right there. We'll get in a mess later. Okay. Well, <laughs> fantastic. So he went to separating, separate, decompartmentalization. Is mm-hmm. really of what your logic saying. from your brain. Mm-hmm. So you're looking in the mirror. You give the headache to another person. Mm-hmm. Okay. If you get one of those great Jordan Peele mirrors, perhaps that'll work. Perhaps. Mm. But Ron said, tried it a few days later. And it worked. It did not work. It It did not work. That's a placebo. (laughs) No, no, it worked. He gave his headache to the man in the mirror. And then when he left the mirror, the man in the mirror disappeared and the headache disappeared with it. And meanwhile, that man's just like, whoa, am I in here with Michael Jackson? (laughs) And that's all it took to sell Ron on Scientology. That's it. Done. Well, because up to this point, he was struggling with David because the one thing he said is that when David was born, he said that the toddler was extremely aberrantly strong (laughs) as a child. He said that David as a toddler was so physically strong he could lift him up to the top of a door frame and that he'd let the toddler grab onto the door frame and he'd let him go and that the toddler could pull himself up Doing pull ups on okay. the door frame with his own hands, like Hezbollah. That's terrifying. It's yeah, like Hezbollah is an adult. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Same size, right? Oh, they yeah. do this. And so the, 
But then he'd get these asthma attacks, and Ron didn't know what to do with these asthma attacks. Besides, like, take him to a doctor and get him an inhaler, right? He said, <laughs> yeah. having these, this is true. Yeah. This is true. He didn't know how to deal with it. He didn't know, so he would do stuff like um, he would spank him. He spanked David to try to get him to stop Smart. doing the asthma attacks, and that didn't work. And then he started doing this thing where he'd he'd bundle raw, he'd bundle David up in his arms and take him into a cold shower and do that to get rid of his asthma attacks. Because he said he was in his mind. Ron thought that the asthma attacks he thought that were in they were in David's head. Really, and smart. so then he started a thing where he said, "Well, maybe in order to cure him of his asthma attacks." What I've discovered is that every single time he's having one, I tell him to go into the garage and lift weights. And this is completely real. Yeah. Uh -huh. So that David Miscavige would go out as a little boy, like to between five and nine, and just lift pump iron. Okay. Every single time he felt like he was having an asthma attack. the blood flowing a little but bit. But it, it's also probably why he's only five foot three. Oh. <laughs> it's because he's been jacked since he's five. <laughs> yeah. And again, I don't think that normally beats asthma attacks. No, I don't wow. think so. I'm not real sure. I don't know. I'm not a well, pulmonologist. It might help the heart beat a little bit. It might offset some of I the... Feel like I feel like if I heard someone else do that, technically you have to call like the government, <laughs> right? Like if you heard someone doing that to their child, you have to call CPS. We're yeah. not supposed to have lift heavy weights at that age. Mm. But you can lift little weights. A little bit. <laughs> little play school weights. You can lift little weights. You're supposed to lift heavy weights at that age. Now, as I said, Ron Miscavige was a fucking rube. But most people, especially when Scientology was new, they needed a little more convincing to completely give themselves and their entire families over to the philosophy of a ruddy science fiction author of middling success. Just the smallest amount of more information. Yeah. By word count, though, he was the most successful writer of all time. By, <laughs> By amount of words written. Yeah. Well, to get this done, Scientologists followed what they called the four-step dissemination drill. First, you gotta make contact. Okay. Then, after you make contact, yes. in a very telling directive, the Scientologist then had to immediately disarm any antagonism the individual might display towards Scientology. Take it apart. Okay. Yeah. You don't know anything. I didn't. What am I? Okay. <laughs> well, this concept is still in full usage today. In a Scientology ad released on November 25th, just a couple of months ago, David Miscavige himself appears and says this. Whatever you've heard. <laughs> If you haven't heard it from us, we're not what you expect. Whoa, they're different than what I expected. Yep, that's their entire thing because they know that everybody knows that Scientology is a scam. Everyone right. knows that, but that's the, they that now what they're doing is they're trying to play these games, these mind games on a massive scale mm -hmm. with we're not what you expect and curious, both playing at the same time. And all religions need to be persecuted. Mm -hmm. So they're in oh, the yes. phase whatever of that as oh, well. Yeah. And now you show up and you are if you're already speaking to a member of Scientology. You're already probably a seeker, yeah. right? You already of are course. looking for information. Yeah. So it's easy to do the next part. Yeah. If you've mm -hmm. stopped in your tracks and talked to them, you're halfway there. Everyone has gone through a moment of low. Sure. Mm -hmm. And it can last a long time, too. Oh, yeah, man. I mean, I'll go into Scientology later on, but I'm sticking for management. I have to go straight <laughs> to school. I want to jump in like they do with like military school. Yeah. yeah. And then you jump into the, the officer role. It's going to immediately make you the fall guy. Uh, yeah, that's a problem. But at least I don't. I'm not good enough with like Quicken or like <laughs> kind of like financial records. Like I, they wouldn't even let me near that. So yeah. hopefully, because that's where they really get you. I mean, I gotta admit, man. Like when doing research for this, I was checking out the Scientology website, and they make it look really nice. Sure, like, it's nice. Just, I mean, that's the thing. Is that that's the word I would choose? It's just nice. They yeah. make it look nice. If I mean, you they already got, a nerd. It's like Jesus has Chris Pratt, and Scientology has Tom Cruise. <laughs> Who do you want to be? I uh, I could go. I mean, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Either of those people appeal to different types. Mm -hmm. Well, the third step in the dissemination drill is to, quote, find the ruin, which is mm -hmm. identifying the problem that's most on the mind of the potential recruit. In Ron Miscavige's case, it was his son's asthma problem. To that point, the recruiter then hooks the mark by promising that Scientology is the answer. Mm. Now, that answer is provided, or at the very least dangled, by immersing the recruit in the writings of L. Ron Hubbard, 
whose life is presented as a grand adventure featuring tales of how he healed himself using the techniques that became Scientology's foundational document, Dianetics. Bathe yourself in the words of L. Ron Hubbard. <laughs> but first, wet yourself on the tongue of L. Ron Hubbard. <laughs> mm. Wait, no, if you read it, I guess that's what it is. I have Shane Morton, my mentor, and the, the guy who was the creative director for Your Pretty Face is Going to Hell, he always talks about you never want to get yourself into the rhythm of a cult leader. Yeah. And that's what mm. it is. The more you read the first 50 pages of the opening spiel of the romance right. of everyone's favorite turtle lord, you do start <laughs> to get into the cadence. You mm -hmm. get into a rhythm, That's and a then if, you know, then you, you get Gloria Stefan all the way to the hole. That mm -hmm. is a fantastic point, though, when you get in that rhythm, and mm -hmm. that becomes... It was interesting. I was listening to some of these... Um, I don't even want to mention it, That Andrew Tate influencer, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And a lot of his defenders sound just like him. Oh, like sure. They have the yeah, same they're little cadence. robots. Yeah. yeah. It was just very interesting to hear that kind of, yeah, that kind of mimicking well, of their uh, super god or whatever. It's like they say that you're uh, fluent in the language the first time that you dream in that language. And it's the same way with the cult leader. Once your thoughts start to mimic right. the way they speak, then you're fucking you're done. You're done. Yeah. Well, recruits are told that Scientology will produce a civilization without insanity, without criminals, and without war, where man can rise to greater heights, attain spiritual freedom, and discover one's own immortality. Don't you want to live forever? <laughs> well, I mean, kind of. Additionally, recruits are told that Scientology works 100% of the time. Well, that's great. But only when it is properly applied by a person who sincerely desires to improve their life. KSW, keep Scientology working. Think oh about God. it. So if it fails, guess what? You failed. It's yeah. also the a lot. The tech doesn't fail. The tech's written down. <laughs> you see this failure? No. This tech is right here. It it's is. right here in my goddamn ass. It can't fail. It's just written right here. I agree. <laughs> it's also the same base of, uh, uh, of thought with Nutrisystem. <laughs> Mm. You're the failure. You're the failure. You're failing Jenny yeah. Craig right now. Aww. Well, put another way, recruits are told that Scientology only works if you give yourself over completely and question nothing. Great. I mean, that's how we got half the employees here. That's perfect. And honestly, I, I really want to thank that's them. True. I want to thank them. And so Ron Miscavige figured that if Scientology could cure his piddling headache that one time, then maybe it could cure his son's extremely serious asthma. Mm. Now, supposedly, a Scientologist named Frank did cure a nine-year-old David Miscavige's asthma after a single 45-minute-long session in Frank's back office. They just met Frank, right? They just met Frank. Frank was the local Scientologist. His other buddy, I guess at Macucci's, whatever the place was <laughs> yeah, called. Macucci's. Macu Macucci's. I'm going down Macucci's house. <laughs> right. but like, but they, when they found, met him at Macucci's, yeah. he was just like... <laughs> All I do is fix kids. <laughs> and then like, he was like, boom. He's like, Scientology, bib, zip, zip, zap. We're going to do this. We're going to get it done. And then he did probably what a touch assist, which touch is assist, legitimately yeah. a whole, there's a whole diagram in here, how to properly massage illness out of people. And mm -hmm. guess what? You do start. And of course, you always lay a strange nine-year-old boy down <laughs> on, a, on a cot in the back room of your office. Mm -hmm. And you always want to needle him from the top of his butt to the top of his head and back and forth and back and forth <laughs> and back and forth until he doesn't have asthma anymore or at least until he says, please, for the love of God, <laughs> you old man, please stop touching me. Yeah. I don't have asthma anymore. And I'll say whatever it takes <laughs> mm -hmm. to yeah. assist you in not touching me. I think I may have met a Frank or two <laughs> in my life. Well, from what Ron Miscavige said, his son never had a serious asthma attack ever again. Now, this is, of course, a lie. Or it's at the very least a massaging of the truth. Excellent. Because it's important to note that Ron Miscavige remains an ardent believer in Hubbard's vision of Scientology. He's left Scientology, but he still believes in Scientology. He believes that his son ruined everything, but he still thinks that the tech is 100% real. Yeah. To oh. be fair, it's like when your kid takes over, you're like, I know you. <laughs> you know, so it would be very difficult to just follow your child as he's got. Well, mm -hmm. he just let it all go. and But yes, the book has a, a deeply hard time letting go of our LRH yeah. at all. But nevertheless, this supposed curing of his son's asthma was enough to convince Ron and his wife to give their lives over completely to the church. 
Now, at this point in Scientology's existence, 1972, one of the church's main strongholds was St. Hill in England, which is still owned by Scientology, and Scientology does still consider it a holy site. It's I'm, actually one of the holiest sites in Scientology. Huh. There's probably only two people working there. Like yeah. you have the guy, but that's it. Like the guy outside keeping people out, and then the fucking guy on the inside, I guess, sweeping for Ron. Yeah. Well, yeah. supposedly a chosen wing of St. Hill was Tom Cruise's lockdown sanctuary during the height of coronavirus. Yeah, Very him and fun. David Miscavish used to hang out there measuring to see whose belt buckle was higher than the other. <laughs> oh, isn't that nice? Tom Cruise, taller than David Miscavige. That's what we're perhaps. saying, that Towers yeah. over him, man. Yeah. Not towers. Not, <laughs> no, not, not towers. towers. He's three inches. Wait, three Tom inches? Cruise, Tom Cruise is five foot six, right? I would uh, say five five five, five, four. five. Okay, he well, David, heels. David Miscavige is five three. Between five, the four. heights of four, four foot five and five foot five, one inch is towering. <laughs> it is. I, That's how it is. It just gets small people math. Okay. Um, this is also St. Hill. This is also where Hubbard did his infamous tomato experiments. Oh, yeah. I remember yeah. those. In which he audited tomatoes and took readings of their well-being using an e-meter. And I want you to keep that in mind here in a bit when we go through auditing. But by 1972, Scientology and Scientologists were banned in England. So anyone traveling to St. Hill had to smuggle their e-meters and their L. Ron Hubbard novels <laughs> like they were trying to sneak drugs over the border. Man. This is why you really can't ban things because it makes it too cool. Yeah, I, that's the idea. If you got to go covert with it. It's, it makes the religion stronger. It's mm -hmm. contraband now. It is. But despite England's hostility towards their beliefs, Ron Miscavige, looking to rapidly progress his family through the church, he pulled his kids out of school and moved the entire family across the ocean to St. Hill for 15 months. Just wow. think about that. Think about the fact that he just met a man named Frank <laughs> who gave his headache to a man in the mirror oh my God. and then massaged the butt of his son until he stopped fake sneezing anymore. Right. And now you're going to move the entire family to England yeah. from Mount Carmel so that you can have them all directly in the bosom of a brand new religion. Yeah, is it to possible? England where your religion is illegal. Isn't it possible that Mount Carmel was How dare you? <laughs> how, how dare you? Dip? <laughs> Ron, hear me out. Maybe, you, maybe your town sucks mm. and you want any reason to get out of it. No. And you found it with Scientology. No. <laughs> you like to watch the Friday night football no, games? No, he wanted to play his trumpet. Yeah, You can do did. that anywhere. But Scientology, remember, I mean, Scientology is actually above synonym when it comes to jazz musicians. Scientology is full of jazz musicians. Chick Corea. Chick Corea was number one. Chick Corea, yeah. And uh, remember the Scientology jazz record that we played during yeah. the hour? It's surprisingly good. <laughs> but like, the, the interesting thing with jazz is it's all about editing. But Scientology, what? as it's written, it's not at all edited. It's about the notes you don't play. <laughs> You're talking about editing in their mind. Editing in their mind. Yes. Yeah, but, but sometimes jazz is all is... about letting go. No edits. Actually, no. most of the time jazz is about letting go. No edits, man. I know this. I watched the Ken Burns documentary on jazz. <laughs> and it's about the notes you don't, don't play. play. Yeah, yeah. I, I I like it when it's backwards. Zaj. Yeah. Then it's just the, Where it's just... <laughs> 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 it's nope. the notes you shouldn't play. <laughs> Now, at this point, David Miscavige and his twin sister, Denise, were 12 years old. And within a year of arriving at St. Hill, both of them were auditors, the youngest auditors in Scientology history. Nope. Now, for those of you who don't know, let's briefly go through what auditing entails, what it is, just so you can decide for yourself whether or not a 13-year-old is up to this task. I can't even imagine sitting down as an adult male across Cross from a 13-year-old. Cross of a 13-year-old. The, the cruel incisive nature of a child. Oh, so brutal. Ugh. So brutal. Well, the theory of auditing is that it locates and discharges mental masses that are blocking the free flow of good energy. Thank you for finally putting in a way that makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> well, according to Hubbard, ideas and fantasies have physical weight and solidity, and they root themselves in the mind as phobias and obsessions. Unless, your fears, your obsessions, yeah. those have weight. Those are physical. Unless they're in there, Barrow. But you remember, they're separate, right? Because you're your liquid death, right? Yeah. Your fears and your obsessions are the rock star, right? But well, we got to get rid of the rock star because what's that doing? It's poisoning your Whataburger water. Oh, okay, <laughs> got it. By talking through these fears... For those that don't know, I'm drinking out of a Whataburger mug. Uh, but yeah, it's a, it's a Whataburger-style mug. We're not in Texas right now. By talking, <laughs> by talking through these fears and obsessions in an auditing session with a trained Scientological auditor to guide you, 
these mental masses are broken up and purged. It's like clearing out a drain. Got you. I mean, you know, you do feel weight when you're depressed or, you know, ang- anxious. It does feel I mean, yeah. like, a, like a weight you know, on you. That's all you do a weight is, is lifted off my yes, chest. Okay. A weight is lifted off my shoulders. These are, these are things that we're, we're used to hearing, you know, like that's a, that is the thing about Scientology. It takes that little thing that you do have some relation to and it blows it out to something huge. And then you also understand, but there's, there's certain things, right? Because most human beings immediately feel better when you sit and talk about yourself for a while. Mm -hmm. So that's one thing, kind of like how they say, you know, it's actually, yes, you're addicted to the nicotine with cigarettes, but the relaxation part of it is the act of taking a deep breath, which is what we don't do as often in American society. And now Marcus can't breathe. And now he can't breathe. (laughs) (laughs) Unrelated reasons, but I can't breathe. Yeah. What they they do is they put the cans in your hand of the E-meter and then it jumps back and forth. And then what they do is infer meanings to the jumps in the e-meter from the words that you say. But even the e-meter's yeah. technology means nothing. Well, that's the I'll thing. I'll just go, I'll just go with the tarot cards. Yeah. It is. I, I like it the is. tarot cards better. Because the the oh. e-meter stuff was invented by a guy named Volney Matheson that the L. Ron took it from. Yes. And again, it's just, it's just charges. It just it just bounces. Mm-hmm. Well, this is the e-meter is how they sell Scientology as science. Right. The e-meter, it's a little machine that measures those negative mental masses that I was talking about. I have one headed to my house. An e-meter, really. Oh, we're getting this whole fucking ship in line, my <laughs> friend. Fantastic. Well, these masses are detected by little sticks held by the auditee. The auditee, by the way, is called a pre-clear. Get that straight. Yeah. I got it. Pre-clear. The pre-cum of Scientologists. Yes. <laughs> Correct. You can still get you pregnant. <laughs> Absolutely. If the needle moves to the right while the pre-clear is holding the sticks, the resistance is rising, which is bad. Oh. But if it moves to the left, the resistance is falling, which is good. good. Star Wars. This is what the Scientologists who haunted the train station at 42nd and 8th in Manhattan, that's what they were trying to get you to sit down and do. That whole mm-hmm. free personality test thing. They wanted, yep. to, they wanted you to sit down, hold the sticks, the needle goes all, all over the place, and they say, whoa, buddy. You need to come in for some more auditing. Yeah, I'm in a New York City subway station. I'm a little fucking stressed. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. But what they do is they, they have a personality test where they say a bunch of things to you and they watch the e-meter. Mm-hmm. And so, like, let's say, like, you're talking about, like, whatever, blah, blah, blah. And then, like, on the word broom, the e-meter jumps. And they're like, what's about what's with brooms? <laughs> what's with brooms? It's like, Man, that is the thing. What I... is it about brooms that you don't like? What is it about brooms that you are like being affected by. I mean, honestly, that does make me think of the old wives tale that people used to jump off the refrigerator with a broomstick in their ass and then they would die. What? Do you old, remember that? I have no. What the fuck are you I talking no about? I don't know. Maybe, I have one, one, maybe okay. it was a Stephen Wilson 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 story. Thing. It no, is but, a story that did happen. This did happen to somebody. We covered no, our round table of gentlemen. Yeah, but it's not an old wives tale. I don't tale. think it ever actually happened. Oh, it was, it was when I was a child. I think it was homophobic. Oh, fridge with Broom in up buttocks. ass. Up this ass? is gonna be great. Okay, this in is gonna buttocks. be great. Broom death. This is from Snopes. Did a coed die? It says here it's a legend according to Snopes. A coed fatally I'm, skewers itself or masturbating with a with a broom hand. <laughs> it went all the way to Snopes. It's a legend. It's a or, wives' yeah, tale. Yeah. It is honestly. It is like Paul Bunyan. It <laughs> is. Yeah. Well, that's the thing. If the pre clear gives an answer during auditing that makes the needle jump to the right, oh. then the subject of that answer becomes an area of concentration. Like Henry said, you say broom, it jumps, oh, let's concentrate on brooms. But the thing is about that is that the auditor is just going to fucking hammer away at the subject until they find something. Because you can keep playing word association sure. until you find a bad feeling. But then the auditor keeps hammering until they're satisfied that they've drained the pre clear of the troubling experience or feeling. Basically, you talk about it until you feel better again. All right. I admit it. I indeed have not seen a broomstick. I have not shoved up my ass. (laughs) Yes, indeed. I enjoy it. Good. All clear. (laughs) This is also where overts and withholds come into play. We're going to get into a little bit more terminology here. God, just keep your fucking hats on. We have most of these books come with a glossary that we should put out. We should put out one of our glossaries that people can get more Scientological terms in their heads. We've had our team build a pretty goddamn good glossary for us over the course of this series. But isn't that also a component of the search and the fun aspect of it. Sure. Mm-hmm. Right? Because mm-hmm. you're like, oh, what's that word mean? And you it's the look idea. It up and you you're get talking all about the in. you're talking about the ultimate torture of Scientologists, which is about the misuse of words. Yeah. And oh. how that is a an MU is one of the worst things that you can do in Scientology. And you are M-U. you are supposed to travel everywhere with a dictionary in your pocket. Wow, a misuse? That's an it's MU. A, well, it's mis it's misdoing a word, it's mis saying a word, misunderstanding a word. Mm-hmm. If something bad's happening in a pre-clear's life, 
then it was because they'd done something bad that does the least good for the least number of people or the most harm to the greatest number of people. They have committed an overt. Well, they actually get a third heart like Dick Cheney, but that's okay. (laughs) But if they didn't admit to the overt immediately, they were then committing a withhold, which is keeping a secret. And that withhold combined with the overt that's what's causing your unhappiness. Yeah, not your body, <laughs> not the way that you eat or no. all the things that you've done. Okay. And, it's and how, your clam. Yeah. And you made clam problems back when you were a clam. So, and now you're suffering from your clam problem. <laughs> all right. So it's because they did something wrong. They're not acknowledging it and they're not doing anything to fix it. So they're upset. Yeah. But you see, again, this is base level before we understand it's not even you. It's your thetans inside of you. And eventually you have to figure out how to talk to your thetans and release those overts and withholds from your thetans inside of you. Mm-hmm. Well, I'm actually going to go catch my train. It's been great to be here. I'm stopped. I'm happy I stopped for the you're free stressed. cookie at the subway. I am stressed. I am stressed. I've got to get to fucking 54th Street. I've got to fight an entire mob of Santa Clauses because it's Santa Con. Well, in Hubbard's view, overts and withholds were the sole reason for all bad conditions and experiences. So constantly purging oneself of all overts and withholds was a necessary part of the auditing process. This, of course, is how Scientology collects blackmail. Because you say all of this shit and you don't understand that it's kept in your KR until you start going into the OT and then all of the the shit you said before comes up again and you got to re-release it all again. And can you explain what KR is? We'll get into it. Yeah. Fantastic. Basically, it's just every secret you tell them goes into a file and they keep it. Your ethics file. Mm -hmm. Your case. Live from your grave. You ever want to try to sound professional? All right, just try to sound professional and extremely difficult. So what do you do, right? Me? Use periods. It's declarative sentences. It seems professional. It's perfunctory, right? It just delivers a message and information, and then you walk away from it. But what I find is that when you leave a period with being like, we'll talk about this in the meeting next week, period, right? And you send that to somebody. A lot of times it sounds like you're about to read them the filth, which is why you need Grammarly, right? Because when it comes to work, communication is key. Even if you don't have a quote unquote writing job, because all jobs require writing unless you're a mime. Grammarly's Premium's advanced tone suggestions help you communicate confidently and reframe your words to be more positive and productive, right? It makes you say stuff like, isn't that fun? And gee willikers, I can't wait for the deposition. Reframe negative language to be more solution focused so you can better collaborate with your team, coworkers, and clients. I'm going to come over there and kill your family, exclamation point. I'm going to come over and kill your family. Seems cute. Seems fun. The right tone can move any project forward when you get it just right with Grammarly. Go to Grammarly.com slash tone to download and learn more about Grammarly Premium's advanced tone suggestions. That's G-R-A-M-M-A-R-L-Y D-O-T com slash T-O-N-E. Now, the ultimate goal of auditing is to emancipate the Scientologist from the laws of matter, energy, space, and time. Nest. You know, he, he said mess yeah. before. That's what mess is. You know what? It, That's a lot to emancipate a person from. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Because they're pretty persistent. <laughs> yeah, the whole biological thing. And if you're still all fucked up with your mess, then you're pre-clear. But if through auditing, you cleanse yourself of your mess, your obsessions, your fears, your irrational urges, you will then and only then become clear. Okay. That's what going clear means. I guess if this is the, it's just, if it ended there, well, I'd that's what like, di- that's what Dianetics right. was. And we covered that in the LRH series. Dianetics was getting you clear and then released. But then LRH understood, I need to bring them back. I yeah. How do I mind. keep them back in? And then what right. you do is you turn it into a spirituality. You create the idea of Thetans. And then OT, once you get past clear, the OT levels are all about doing all of these same processes, right. but with the little ghosts that live inside of you. Because really, <laughs> isn't this just, this is uh, just a... It's just got a little props, but it's just the same as Catholicism or, you know. You mean made up, like completely, totally just fictional and that certain things have a placebo-like effect. Yeah. But then the rest of it is just absolute arcane garbage and then fucking like full like punishment systems. Yes. Well, it does help when you did something wrong and you want to like talk to somebody about it and all those things. But then Catholicism is like, and now you got to go down this road. Evangelicalism takes you down the whatever path. And then here they just wanted to sell you more books and stuff. Yeah, they were excited. I mean, the difference is that you could technically be a Catholic and never pay a dime your entire life and you still get the Catholic experience. No. 
You got to pay. You don't yeah, have to. I mean, that's not really good. I got, well, this is like Catholicism. Buddy, it's true. I'm telling you, there's I, like, oh, no. Yeah, it's like when you go into the, one of those restaurants where it's like, it's free, donation only. You don't tip and you get a sandwich. My friend, people are going to judge you. And, Catholics uh, don't really gonna, want you. They're going to judge you, but you could still do it for free. Yeah, you could, still, you could still do it. Truthfully, Catholics yeah. don't want you. They don't really want you. It's <laughs> yeah. everybody. Capital C Christians want you, but Catholics think that none of you are good enough. Yeah. The only people who are good enough are the pedophiles we put super uniforms on. there you go really powerful <laughs> really powerful evangelicals you better fucking tip yeah you better but as far as david miscavige's wonderkin status in scientology went he was made an auditor at 13 all that shit that we yeah. just talked about he was 13 years old with all that power in his in his hands and he was clear by the age of 15 and even though there was a lot of people trying to stop him from being clear there were several people saying like his reports are actually coming back like highly disturbed and yeah. they're all like one guy actually wanted to straight up like blow him. They wanted to get rid of him. They wanted wow. to like, well, yeah. We're gonna get to that here in a second. We're gonna get in that full story. But this served to instill in David the idea that he was an incredibly special person in an incredibly special group. But David also had obvious emotional problems. What are you talking about? It's unbelievable. <laughs> yeah, he seems so calm and put together. According to one former Scientologist named Evard Scott, who was tasked with watching over David when David was a young teenager. David apparently had episodes caused by what they called asthmatic seizures, which, if true, means that David Miscavige had both asthma and epilepsy. Seems, though, this probably isn't true. No. From what it sounds like, David Miscavige may have simply been emotionally disturbed and violent from a fairly young age. Every time I saw the word asthmatic seizure, I now understood they meant weird temper tantrum. Yes. Everett Scott was told that when David had an episode... Do not touch him because David gets very violent and beats the hell out of you if you do touch him. He oh, that's was, healthy. He was like this out the pussy. Wow. He was slapping and hitting and was a little, I don't know, he was just a tyrant. He's a, a Tasmanian goblin. devil. He's a fucking yeah. goblin. Well, I feel bad for that little twin in there who had to share the womb. Mm -hmm. You just get exhausting. used to it, though. You just get used to it. Scott also remembered that when he was watching over David, he saw the kid take off his shirt in preparation for a shower said that David was so bizarrely and disturbingly buff that he looked like a 13-year-old Arnold Schwarzenegger. Yeah, he, was, he was like a cut child. Yeah. And it's, yeah. it's disturbing. It's that's weird. A cut five foot two child. Yeah, little Hercules. Yeah. Remember that kid? Oh, he yeah. Was yeah. Drugs. yeah, I remember him. It's very creepy. He's devastated now. <laughs> yep. Now, Everett Scott was one of the first people to notice that there was something wrong with young David Miscavige. Despite being held up as an expert auditor at 13... David didn't seem to know how to audit and even said that auditing was for weaklings oh. because he was already clear from a past life. He understood the game <laughs> immediately. Yes. But he's just like, you see, I have visions of a past life, just like LRH did. LRH yeah. traversed the van. Remember when he went through the was the radiation belt mm -hmm. around the moon? Of like course. he went, he, 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 he <laughs> sent his mind there. He sent his mind into the past. He immediately was just saying that stuff as a wow. 15. He was like, well, actually, I looked into my past and I've, I've been clear. Yeah. And there were like, that's incredible. Yeah, wow. This kid's amazing. Yeah, he's a brilliant little sociopath. Okay. But Everard Scott, he wasn't buying it. He filed what's known as a knowledge report against David. Uh-oh. But it seems like someone had a vested interest in David's advancement. Sounds like they needed a wunderkind. Apparently, the Scientology magazine was writing an article about the youngest auditor in history, oh. little Davy Miscavige. And Scott was simply complicating matters. Oh, yeah. He was getting in the way of history, my friend. Uh -oh. It's kind of like how LeBron James was like... Touted pit, very young. Like, at like 15 years old. Like he's going to be the king of sports. They well, did it with David Miscavige, where they were like, he is the guy. And, and it's weird because you had a bunch of other guys that were very much sure they were the guy. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, a 15-year-old shows up and he's terrifying everybody well, LeBron, into believing him. LeBron made him pick him because he was the best. He was yep, the best was basketball different. player of all the yeah. eras he played in. But I wonder if Miscavige truly was the best. Well, Was I he mean, the best at playing the game in Scientology? Yeah, I think so. What I see it as is that instead of somebody, like I don't think he was kind of anointed. I think he was picked as a guy. Yeah. Like, I yeah, think yeah, that yeah. was like, okay, we need like a, a wunderkind. We need like some sort of prodigy here. That kid seems like he knows what's going on. He knows the lingo. He knows how to walk the walk. So let's bring him up and see what he does. And they just and they didn't realize that they had picked 
a monster. Well, because also all of the rest mm. of his brothers and sisters got moved to go to do full on, full time Scientology instructions, right? Yeah. To go through into a full Scientology school. The rest of them are like, I wish I was in school. Like, this is real. I don't want to be here. <laughs> right. And David just jumped in. He yeah. just got it from the second that he mm. arrived at St. Hell. Nevertheless, Evard Scott continued filing knowledge reports on David Miscavige to the ethics office because he was also a strangely misogynistic little boy okay. where he'd say like, God damn, these goddamn broads, they don't belong in Sea Org. <laughs> they don't know how to audit. <laughs> these slits don't know how to break me down. And he, wow. I mean, he was intense there. I remember the, he said that one of the shocking things he saw. So one of the things they do in Scientology is they teach you a lesson and then they do it super abstract. Where they're like, now build the lesson that we just taught you but represent it in play. So you go and you take all the things you just learned, you're supposed to make at least, and then they watch David as a 15-year-old walk down and just go, flunk, 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 like just flunking a whole table of Whoa. adults mm -hmm. that are sitting here making clay figurines, <laughs> trying to make up, trying to represent the fake shit that they all just got taught. And then he understood I just fucking put all of these people in their plates and yeah. everybody loves me for it. Absolutely. Yep. Well, maybe they weren't making the best clay products, were they? They obviously sucked. <laughs> they really may have. They're being suppressive. Yes. That's the thing. When Evard Scott was called into the ethics office to discuss all of these knowledge reports, he thought, finally, finally, I've got through to somebody. They brought him in and said, you, sir, you're interbulating David Miscavige. You're interbulating. I'm interbulating. Yeah. You're interbulating. I don't even know what that means, but I don't even <laughs> understand how I could be interbulating. Oh, uh, you better pull out your dictionary and find out. Oh, but man. guess what? If you went in there, guess what you wouldn't find? Interbulating. It's a new word? <laughs> yep. No, you just made wow. it up. Yeah. Ron, uh, L. Ron Hubbard created the word interbulating. It means to upset someone, to impede someone. I mean, I love the word, to be honest. I, 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 we talk about it. We it love it. Interbulating is a great word. You're interbulating me, and yeah. I'm not going to sit here and stay. I, yeah. I, I, I'm not going to sit here and take that interbulation from you. <laughs> yeah. It's yeah, incredible. Like, we can add it. Words oh, are, yeah. Yeah. I mean, they're all made up. Yeah, of course. Interbulation will take it. Yeah. But instead of backing down, Scott, he stood by his guns. He said, this kid is an SP. A suppressive Ooh. person. Whoa. It's the worst thing that a Scientologist can call another Scientologist. They don't use that word lightly, especially not in 1976. Wow, it sounds like he's really interpolating. <laughs> well, they said that um, David Miscavige was actually outside listening to Evard oh, Scott. Oh, I'm sure he was. I guarantee it. Yeah. Curious. Yeah. <laughs> but when he used the word SP, like, David Miscavige was smart enough to know, like, I got to back off from this guy. I have got to let this guy, I've got to put as much distance between me and this guy as I possibly can. At 15. At 15. Wow. And so, David Miscavige just disengaged and kept climbing up the Scientology ladder uninterbulated. It's a smart decision. Mm hmm By 16, David was done with secular life. He announced that he wanted to devote his life to L. Ron Hubbard. Technically makes David Miscavige a high school dropout. Most of them huh. were. Most of the heads of Scientology were high school dropouts because yeah. they didn't believe in high school. Well, I mean, so was Kanye, and he's fine. <laughs> <laughs> Yay! Yay! Self-educated. But as far as David was concerned, he was on to greater things because in 1976, he joined Sea Org. Hurt, hurt. <laughs> Come on, boys. We're going to show. And there it is. Also, I believe college dropout was the reference that Thank I was you. trying to make. Thank yep. you. But now he's in Sea Org. <laughs> yeah. Basically, Sea Org is like the Vatican of Scientology. Sweet. Where the, yeah. It's where the highest ranking members serve. And that's where they make the decisions that affect every Scientologist. It's also where they make the decisions that affect non-Scientologists. Oh. It's also, you know, it's changed over the years because some people like... It used to be the elite, and then it turned into those that work the hardest to turn into our free labor like mm -hmm. world, and then that got bumped down to the RPF. So then Sea Org became like it's strange because they both are like the most slave like members of Scientology, mm, yeah. but they also the high rankings of the they're both like the lowest class and the highest class all in one. Well, it's basically that is where Sea Org is where Scientology truly becomes a cult. Okay. You know, like even outside of like all the. It's where the billionaire contract is. Yeah. All the fucking Scientologists that are coming in and out of celebrity centers here in L.A. that are paying their money to get pre-clear and do it. They're not even they don't even know they're not even a part of Scientology. Not really. Mm. They're just fucking they have subscriptions. Yeah. You're right. butts and seats. Yeah. But the people in Sea Org, they're in a cult. Ooh. Mm -hmm. What's an RPF? 
Uh, <laughs> don't even. <laughs> don't no, even please. bother. What? Don't even bother with this <laughs> raw being, meat over here. Oh my <laughs> God! You're you're being imbustuous. What is it called? <laughs> imbustuous. He could say <laughs> that. Wow. Well, yeah. You're being goddamn imbustuous. Yeah. yeah. Now, Sea Org, it's a naval No org. answer. <laughs> no answer? <laughs> oh, well, we'll see. We'll find oh out if he God. finds out. Okay. okay. Now, Sea Org, they are a naval organization. But not everything in Sea Org necessarily has to take place on a boat. Although boating is certainly a part of Sea Org. Well, okay. boating lifestyle. <laughs> because once the boat became permanently... I'm not going to say grounded. Uh-huh. Um, I'm going to say docked. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, because the boat used to be called Flag, right? Then it got parked in front of the Clearwater like organization building, it's, which is now Flag. Yeah. They put the, they flat parked it there, so that's there. And then like they can't move it anymore yeah. because they don't have enough people to like man it anymore because mm-hmm. it's a giant, massive super it's a yacht, big boat. right? Yeah. Yeah, so Sea Org is a frame of mind, much like it's how about hats. Margar- <laughs> Margaritaville is in a place. It's an idea. Yes, it's a thought virus. Okay. Now, once David Miscavige dropped out of high school, he was sent to Clearwater, Florida, the global headquarters of Scientology. One of the most bizarre places I've ever been in my life. You're welcome. (laughs) You know, when you go to the Scientology headquarters, like, you know, when you feel a building is empty, you feel like the headquarters are completely empty. You feel like everyone that's on the property is outside watching everybody that's that's looking at the headquarters from across the street. Weird. And they follow you to your car. I was, oh, nice. Well, that's nice to get that kind of courtesy walk. <laughs> On the channel, growing up in Scientology, I learned a lot about how a lot of these centers now tr- truly probably have like two or three people working in them. Yeah. Wow. There in Clearwater, David was named a member of the Commodore's Messenger Organization, the CMO, which wow. is a bizarre paramilitary wing of Sea Org that was at this point made up of terrifying children. Oh, yeah. Because <laughs> LRH army. understood that the kids are the future. Yeah. And you got to indoctrinate them while they're children to get them in it. And yes. And yes, was a lot of the Commodore's messengers, little girls putting clothes onto LRH because he didn't have the proper dexterity of his fingers anymore sure. because he was dying of various, you know, like, I think he had the most advanced case of gout <laughs> that anyone's ever had. He had, phantom, awesome. to- he had phantom toes. Oh. I mean, like, he did not know where his, his fingers didn't work. So he'd have them dress him and stuff like that. Yeah, well, but he good. wasn't a squeezer. I don't think he did any lick or touch or at all. No, I don't no, think not so. From, not from our episodes. No, anyway. not that anyone can tell. Okay, well that's a that's a benefit. That is good. Yep. <laughs> there you go. Well, I mean, Elrond, he was he said very explicitly with the Commodore's Messenger organization, uh, he was very inspired by Hitler. Let's yeah. just try to. Uh, like, <laughs> all I'm saying. Is why don't we separate the art from the artist? <laughs> right. All right. And yes, time has not been positive yeah. to Hitler. Yes. Well, does does Hugo Boss, does the clothes have a political affiliation? <laughs> does a Mercedes have a political affiliation? Yeah, but we'll take the style, not the substance. That's right. Yeah, yeah. L. Ron Hubbard did say, like, Hitler was a madman. He but. was a madman, but every time a madman has a dream, half of it's great. Yeah. And he said the Hitler Youth was the best idea that Hitler ever came up with because you have a blank slate on which you can write anything. Well, truly, they were all part of it, too. You were just shoved right in there. Mm-hmm. So after a year in Clearwater, David Miscavige was transferred to a Scientology base in La Quinta, California, called Cineorg, which is where L. Ron Hubbard himself was hiding in the last stages of his life trying to make movies. Yeah, the Golden Era Production Studios. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Now, there were about 70 people on the La Quinta base, but everyone there was working towards making movies under LRH's direction. Quite quickly, David Miscavige rose to the rank of chief cinematographer. Wow. And by 18, Miscavige was sitting at the right hand of his religion's founder. And sometimes it's about physical distance. Mm -hmm. Because if you want to get someplace... Absolutely. Talk about, like, you know, one thing people are missing, like, it's... you got to jump in when these decisions are being made. If you're looking to take over whatever crooked organization that you're in right now and you want to be number one and you're sick of being number eight, what you got to do is find out where number one eats lunch or what number one likes to do as a hobby. And then you just keep being there yeah. with number one. Because eventually what happens with the number one, they get dementia. The police are coming to arrest them. You get all this stuff <laughs> happening. You're under all this pressure. Eventually they get arrested. 
if you're just standing in the room, yeah. sometimes you can become number two just because it's like, you're in charge now. <laughs> All just, right. just call my, just pick up the phone when I call from Jeff. <laughs> yep. Don't expect many things going in your favor if you're not in the room, if you're not with the decision makers. I'm, I mean, sometimes they don't care about sometimes you. all it really takes is just you saying, all right, you're the first one to say that after everything mm-hmm. falls apart. You're the first one to say, like, all right, here's what we're going to do. And then all of a sudden you're in charge of Scientology for the next 40 years. <laughs> yeah, seriously. But working right underneath David Miscavige at Senate Org was one of the men who would eventually be in David's inner circle and would also later become Scientology's most high profile defector. This was where David Miscavige met Mike Rinder. Boo. Oh, you're going to boo <laughs> Mike, the boo I like Mike, Mike Rinder. Mike, Mike Rinder. He's another one of those guys. He's tried. He's come out. He's done horrible things, but we must forgive when Abs- someone is trying is, to make amends. Is, I agree. I agree. Is he the guy from my Scientology movie? Yes. The bald dude that no, well, does not- all the reenactments? Is it that guy? No, you no. might be thinking of I um, that ba- guy's Bunyan. Name. Uh, Bunyan. Paul Runyon. <laughs> it's I know who you're saying. I know what uh, you're talking about. Oh, uh, Marty uh, Bunyan. Marty Janetti. Rath- Marty Marty Rathbun. Marty Rathbun. Yes, uh, Marty Rathbun. Okay. See, that's all it takes. It's a little bit of work. Uh, but Mike Rinder is this guy who's with Leah Remini. Yeah. Yeah. Got he you, thought he you. could dare replace Kevin James. I don't <laughs> think so, sir. Not my king of queens. Now, Mike Rinder's parents were early adopters of Scientology. They joined in 1959 in Australia through a neighbor who regularly drove the 500 miles from Adelaide to Melbourne to hear Dianetics lectures from Hubbard himself. Mike was just five years old when his parents joined, but by the time he was six, he was already being dropped off at the local Scientology Center for indoctrination seminars called Children's Communication Courses. At least they got to go to school. The other kids in the United States had to be put on the ranch was the Scientology's version of the troubled teen industry, Mm. where they just had to pull weeds because LRH said it it gets you closer to mest. Yeah. Okay. Well, here at these Children's Communications Courses... Children were taught a drill called bull baiting, which is somewhat similar to the game that we discussed in our Synanon episode. Bull baiting was meant to help auditors control their reactions to anything that might be said in counseling sessions if a conflict were to break out. That Mm. conflict, by the way, that's called a firefight in a Scientology, in the Scientology terminology. That's kind of fun. Yeah, firefight. And additionally, bull baiting also trained kids and adults to rid themselves of any impulse to flinch in the face of intimidation out in the real world. Because as Scientologists, they were going to be met with resistance. Oh, yeah. And right. it's about being it's about being emotionless. They want you to be able to control your reactions and invariably not question things that you are taught. Yeah. Mm. Kids would be verbally and sometimes physically assaulted until, quote, the button was flat. That means that the student no longer reacted in any way to the coach's provocation. You got to keep pressing the button, pressing the button, pressing the button until the button disappears. My God, that used to happen with the old Nintendo the old Nintendo button. You press it too much. I would get stuck yeah, there. The Sega stuck. button. Yeah, but that's what not what you were trying stuck. for because that ended your afternoon. Uh huh. Yep, yeah, that wasn't good. So you, you wanna wanted s- the button to be up. You want to <laughs> stick the button though, and then it's all done. On Reinders' reading, bull baiting mostly served to habituate children to future verbal and physical abuse. You can be screamed at and screamed at and screamed at, and you're not going to react. Okay. Now, like England, Australia also outlawed Scientology in the mid-60s, saying that it was a delusional belief system based on fictions and fallacies propagated by falsehood and deception. Yeah, like- nice, even though they put their whole psyop about being watching out for drop bears. <laughs> Australia's always lying. Koala bears, <laughs> government again, against the banning. Mm-hmm. But as it often goes in situations like this, the perceived persecution made families like Mike Rinders believe that they were doing something important. Exactly. I.e., if they're telling me I'm wrong, I must be right because I've been told that I'm going to be told that I'm wrong. So I'm right. Hubbard's right. My auditor is right. And this is indeed a fallen world. We- I mean, they are correct. Again, biggest mistake they made was banning this damn thought process. Well, the mm. inside but it also, of it. But we didn't ban it. And this is where the stronghold is. Yeah, I mean, this is why we're doing an episode on it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, literally, it's also been shat on all over the place in America. Yeah. Yeah. You know? it, it does not have the same cachet, but it's what you do. It's a it's kind of a they talk about it with evangelism in in. Christianity, too, where if you go and 
you're taught that what you do is special yeah. and that other people are going to have an adverse reaction because they're not ready to hear about it. They're not yeah. ready for it. But then or all, they are an enemy. Of and they're you, an enemy. Right? Yeah. And then you go and you try to bring somebody in and they do have a weird reaction to it. And then, but the, yes, you do then feel isolated. But then when you go back to your home group, they all are super happy to see you and it helps double you down inside yeah. of the organization as well. Same thing with you. And you're, you're all the words, all the verbiage. Like you eventually get so like drowning in it. You get so covered yeah. in all, all of the terms yeah. that you start to sound like a crazy person when you talk. You and can't so you can communicate with you, anyone else. Yeah, it makes but you I more say, isolated. You do get some people, and then sure. that's just called a friend group. Yep. How many people do you really need to know? <laughs> and so the Rinders kept giving money to the church and they kept raising their kids as Scientologists. And once Mike was old enough, he, too, joined Sea Org and found himself working under David Miscavige at Cine Org making Hubbard movies. <laughs> <laughs> I just... I it was all instructional work, videos. So I would all rather in... work on Rust. Yeah. yeah. Yes. <laughs> I literally would rather work on it now. I cannot imagine just L. Ron Hubbard... If I Just showed up now. back to if I showed up to set on Rust, I would show up with a fucking bulletproof vest <laughs> and be like, "Fuck all of you! We're doing this bit until this movie stops being made." <laughs> from what Rinder remembers, Miss Cavage was a brash, inflexible, vindictive, aggressively competitive bully who berated his subordinates, Rinder included. But Miss Cavage was also already designated as a so-called rocket within the church, meaning that he'd been tapped as a special person destined for great things. Wow. So this was just right out of the gates. Yeah, this man. guy was supposed to be the man. However, David almost fucked up his entire trajectory when he decided to lighten the mood around Cineorg by filming a skit to give to LRH. Okay. I, we don't know. We can't find out what the skit was. What do you have, have to do? We, we no don't idea. know what it is. No I idea. looked it up. Yeah. We tried finding out. Really? Nobody, nobody has said what the skit is. Because, I mean, at this point, like Elrond, he was reaching the end of his life. Things weren't going particularly well. The mood surrounding him was pretty dark. He was in dark. In the late 70s and the early 80s. I could see that. So David Miscavige, this weird little psychopath, thinks it's time for some skits and bits. Dude, I have to fucking know what this I skit wish was. I could find it. I couldn't find it anywhere. Oh, man. Yeah, we have no clue what it was. Uh, but LRH didn't like it. Yeah. So he didn't like I, it. I'm pretty assuming it must have involved some form of impression. And maybe a little bit of a roast. Yeah, because wow. LRH did not react in a way that he thought that he would. Oh, he man. demanded to know the names of the people involved. Who did this? Oh, <laughs> I don't no. talk like that. <laughs> oh, man. So literally it almost got derailed by a bad comedy sketch. <laughs> As it always does. Oh, God. The only way that Miss Cavage was able to get his ass out of the ringer was to completely renovate one of LRH's houses. He had to rid every single bit of fiberglass in the entire structure because LRH claimed to be allergic to fiberglass, but that got him back in. Yep. Wow. That yeah, it is, tells that's his love language is acts of service. Mm -hmm. Wow. That is, I mean, when we do something bad bit, you just kind of move on. You just mm -hmm. move on. Yeah. But you had to do a whole renovation. Yep. This apparently ingratiated Miss Cavage to LRH considerably because in 1980, when LRH finished his most famous novel, Battlefield Earth, Leverage. <laughs> It's all about leverage. <laughs> Miss Cavage was heavily involved in the process of adapting the novel to film. I don't, you know what? L. Ron should have realized film is not his strong suit. We don't know. Well, today yes. we know Battlefield Earth is one of the worst movies ever made. John Travolta's biggest misstep. But what's lesser known is that John Travolta has actually been attached to this project since 1980. Wow, that's amazing. And you go back and you do watch it with friends. It's kind of fun. Oh, yeah. I think that, again, John Travolta, much like the other, uh, when he was in that Fred Durst movie. Oh, he apparently played that was horrible. It, but the choices that he makes as an actor mm -hmm. in both films yeah. excite me. It's the same thing with Tom Hanks <laughs> yeah. in the Elvis movie. I know no one, everyone disliked it, but I was still like, I can't believe they're letting him fucking do this. Yeah. Like, they're just like, that's power. Is that you get to just suck out loud. And everyone's like, Tom, incredible. Like incredible. every day, like, yeah. wow, great work. Wow, yeah. wow, John, incredible. Live from your grave. Now, concerning Travolta's introduction to Scientology, 
Hubbard knew as far back as 1954 that the best way to promote Scientology was to court celebrities. Mm -hmm. As early as 1955, the Scientology publication Ability published a list of potential celebrity recruits for members to go after. Ooh, ooh. Interestingly, this list included both Bob Hope and Jackie Gleason. Yeah, man. Wow. Two men who in the years since have been revealed as believers in the alien phenomenon. Isn't that weird? Because, yeah, oh, no, Jackie Gleason said that him and Nixon went to an undisclosed location and looked at an alien body together. Yeah. That must have been real smoky and farty and full of whiskey. (laughs) Especially because you probably couldn't see. There was so much smoke you can't see what's in there. No. (laughs) That looks like a cigar UFO. You're smoking a cigar. Oh, yeah. My eyes are too low. Yeah. But when recruiting established celebrities, when that didn't really work out, nobody was recruited. Not initially, huh? Not initially. Scientologists tried a different tack. We got to catch him on the way up. Yes. I remember the Scientology party I, want, I once went to, and it was, it was a group of people getting a lot of work. Buddy, <laughs> yeah. you had so many fucking chances. I know. I, I was right there. Yep. You got to open that mouth. What's the difference between a cock and a hot dog? Nothing. <laughs> What's the difference between being a Scientologist and a Satanist? Nothing. You, I, I you love know what this the difference Frank is? guy. Frank, you're one of the best salesmen I've ever met about you know, what to do with my mouth. The difference is a fucking <laughs> film career is what the difference hey, is. Hey, tell me. I, there's a lot of dicks I probably should have sucked. And, but we wouldn't, you know be what in, this is right we wouldn't be in this room. We wouldn't be. I got something. to. It's called a toothpaste. It's called toothbrush. Use it. And you got yourself a fucking new mouth. <laughs> what? <laughs> suck the dicks. Oh, you want and me to got, suck a dick with a, new, a clean mouth? And then no Great. afterwards. Thank you, Frank. Oh, no. <laughs> after you oh, dirty, I like a dirty <laughs> mouth. And then afterwards. Why don't you just go cure that other little boy of asthma? <laughs> That boy is Corey Feldman. (laughs) And I think he's going to make it. (laughs) Well, way back when, recruiters were placed outside of central casting to pass out flyers for workshops, quote unquote, workshops on how to find an agent or how to get into the Screen Actors Guild. Oh, man. So if you want to find desperate people, that's where you go. Of course. And the answer to both of those questions Scientology. Yeah, that's it's the only way, bro. Yeah, because that's their fronts. You know, like someone shows up thinking like, I'm going to get an agent by the end of the week. And nope. You're just getting to be a Scientologist. That's like wanting to date an Irish Catholic girl, so you just go watch U2 all the time whenever they're alive. <laughs> Every they're alive. But you know what? It's a, but technically, it boils down to the way Hollywood does work in many ways. It's who you know. So it the is. more people that get involved and are in on the game, the easier it is. And then it's not just Scientology. It's the connections within Scientology that get you through. Yeah. And then you find out there's certain celebrity centers or CCs that you can or cannot go to. Like you find out that like the L.A., big celebrity center, the one that's been the big fancy mansion on Franklin, Mm -hmm. it eventually becomes only certain members can come here because now so many people are showing up with screenplays and shit that they're like, well, you don't really make the cut. We need Gia Bonnie Rabisi's dog trainer is actually coming in today and he's going to need this seat. Thank you. I'm sorry. Thank you. It's still, it's a lanyard based culture. Oh yeah. You got to have the right lanyard. Yeah. I know. The big guys, they get to go to the celebrity center. Everyone else has to go to Magnolia and Laurel Canyon. Yeah. Like across the street from the Gulf station. Yeah. 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 The welcoming center. (laughs) (laughs) Well, this, in a roundabout sort of way, this is how Scientology got John Travolta. Mm. In 1969, Travolta was in Mexico making his first film. That was a fun little ball of madness called The Devil's Reign. It's best. fucking amazing. It's so good. It's got Ernest Borgnine as wow. a Satanist. And Ernest Borgnine would ever watch it again because he's like, that was the scariest I ever was. <laughs> and he didn't want to be scary. He said he, he said he didn't like how much the devil was involved because it was the only movie that Anton LaVey actually served as a technical consultant on for Satanism mm-hmm. on a shoot. Like he showed up. Oh yeah. my God. Yeah. Honestly, poor Ernest Borgnine. He's got his eyebrows are too big for yeah. that. <laughs> we actually played some clips from The Devil's Reign on the stream i remember guess what stream's coming back yeah. it's february 21st 2023 but on the set of the devil's reign travolta became friends with an actress dancer and devout scientologist named joan prather travolta confided that he was suffering from depression and insomnia oh joe i'm so sad i <laughs> yeah. can't sleep joe what yeah. am i supposed to do joe <laughs> depression sadness anything about uh closeted uh homosexuality no <laughs> not at all i mean you love musical theater which isn't necessarily no no not no i'm no. just so gay i want to dance in the clouds i want to be in a plane wow oh, mr right. <laughs> 
So <laughs> really good. Really good. <laughs> Great. Did you work on that before? Oh, yeah. Mr. Carter. <laughs> Fucking Mr. hours ago. Yes. So Prather shared that all of her raw emotions have been smoothed out by a philosophy called Scientology. Prather lent Travolta a copy of Dianetics down in Mexico. Travolta claimed it's cured my insomnia, or not cured, helped with my insomnia. I read it put him to about a hundred pages <laughs> of it, and would you believe, Mr. Cotter, I was asleep. Oh, it was like I was a little dog in a pile of sunshine. That means you need to start worshipping golf, because the golf channel puts you to bed, Henry. I, I know. So... When Travolta returned to L.A., he started taking Scientology courses. During one class, he told the teacher he's got a big audition coming up <gasps> for Welcome Back, Cotter. Whoa! <laughs> yeah. How do you think you learn a, how to say it like that? Yeah. It is a big audition. And that would, of course, become John Travolta's breakout role, Benny Barbarino, Sweat Hog. <laughs> yeah, that's a good show. <laughs> but because Travolta was nervous about the audition, the teacher in his Scientology class told everyone in attendance to point in the direction of the ABC studios and telepathically communicate a message. We want John Travolta for the part. We want John Travolta for the part. You know, that's good vibes. They're yeah. sending good vibes to ABC. All yeah, right. it's great. Thoughts and prayers. It always works. Sure. And as it went, John came to the next class with part in hand. <gasps> and within just a couple of years, Travolta would be the world's most famous Scientologist, the church's first big celebrity get. Wow. Now, when the Battlefield Earth movie was being discussed in 1980, John Travolta's star was already somewhat on the wane after the massive success of both Saturday Night Fever and Grease. Mm. But the executive director of Scientology, Bill Franks, still thought that Travolta was right for the lead. Yeah, I mean, it wasn't... He's the guy. He's the number but one Scientologist ready to act. Celebrities used to be able to... I'm not, I don't think that they wanted to, but they would disappear. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. they walk does, away. Doesn't yeah, exist like, anymore. Jack either. Nicholson lives a, a, in an isolated mansion on the top of Mulholland Drive. He is just there, vibing, yeah. mm -hmm. eating fucking par chicken parms, yeah, and hanging out with the women that he hires to sit there and watch him eat sandwiches. They're called Stay hot, nurses. Get loose. Get loose. <laughs> Stay hot. Get loose. Nurses. Okay. Well, <laughs> yes. some of them have their tops off. Yes. Oh. Well, the executive director of Scientology, as I said, Bill Franks, he thought that Travolta was right for the lead. Franks was also the person supposedly in possession of all the auditing records in which John Travolta spoke about his struggles with his own sexuality. Would you believe I look at a set of dick balls and I'm thinking I'm like the boobies. That's okay. You know what? Actually, that's fine. You, you're allowed to be gay. You can be gay if, if that's your... Oh, yeah, that's fine. That's a confusing message. No, it's okay. <laughs> yeah. well, Scientology... Or, or we'll use it uh, as leverage against you for the rest of your career. Leverage. <laughs> And they did. I mean, Franks allegedly told Travolta that if he ever defected, if he ever thought about leaving Scientology, if he ever thought about saying a single bad word about it, all those auditing records, all those times that John Travolta talked about being gay, those would all be made public. Yeah, and, and I can't believe that any six-year-old man with the skin of a 15-year-old boy and thousands of $40,000 toupees who regularly dances in swiveling little motions. <laughs> I can't believe he's gay. Maybe. Well, I think this is a message for the ladies out there. A straight, this is what we look like. Straight men <laughs> look like this. Yeah, you love your Travoltas. He won't to get down on you. What are you saying? Are you what? You're saying that you're the epitome of straight man. <laughs> I am straight man. That's you. You, you, you are the epitome of you straight man. You have to wear soft shoes. <laughs> <laughs> your your piece. Of, I haven't got seen so you big. wear jeans in years. <laughs> Not in two years. <laughs> Not in two years. But that's what I'm saying. Yep. All right. Well, I'll ha I have to take it. I have to take it mm -hmm. as well. Tom Cruise, you don't want to have sex with you. <laughs> <laughs> no, he just wants to have sex with a fucking full, uncut <laughs> trout. I know. That's your theory. Now, when David Miscavige heard that Franks was talking to Travolta about the part in Battlefield Earth, Miscavige had enough power at the age of 18 to demand a meeting with John Tra. 
Pretty soon, Miskovich had taken control of Scientology's biggest star, knowing full well the hold Scientology had over Travolta. Of course, Miskovich had some very disparaging words to say about John Travolta. He did? Yeah, of course. No, he he called him all manner of slurs and said, we've got this guy forever. We got this F word in our pocket is the term that he used. Whoa, I can't believe he said that. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, Ben. Now, of course, nothing came of the 1980 Battlefield Earth movie. And we'll be talking a lot more about John Tra, Tom Cruise, yeah. Kirstie Alley, and all the rest in a later episode. But part of the reason why Battlefield Earth fell apart was because LRH became occupied by other problems. He abandoned Battlefield Earth to escape from a slew of subpoenas concerning Mm. charges that included, but were not limited to, Scientology's mid-70s infiltration of the IRS. Very real criminal charges. No, it's an outsourcing of labor to the IRS from your (laughs) clandestine secret scam religion. Mm. Well, this operation, designed to extort tax-exempt status for the church, it was called Operation Snow White. We talked about it Mm -hmm. much more extensively in our L. Ron Hubbard series. Basically, you put a bunch of Scientologists into the IRS, you get enough dirt until you're finally able to flip the United States government into giving you tax-exempt status. Smart stuff. That's all you gotta do. Yeah, Yeah. that's all you gotta do. But by 1979, the IRS had rooted him out pretty fast. Mm. It didn't take that long. And L. Ron Hubbard's wife, Mary Sue Hubbard, She'd already been convicted of her direct involvement in the affair. Leaving everything in La Quinta behind, Elron, not wanting to go to jail as well, he fled in a white Dodge van, tricked out specifically for Hubbard, had velvet curtains, nice. had a daybed in the back. Yeah. He needs his amenities. He does. And Elron Hubbard eventually settled in an apartment in Newport Beach, California. Now, at this time, David Miscavige was close to L. Ron Hubbard, but he wasn't necessarily in Hubbard's inner circle just yet. Hmm. Rather, he was in the inner circle of Hubbard's inner circle. He's in the outer circle of outer the inner circle. <laughs> he's not the yoke. He's no. just the white, not the yoke. frothy yeah, stuff yeah, he's around. The white. Yeah. See, Miscavige had become friends with Pat and Annie Broker, who were actually two of Hubbard's closest aides. Pat ran secret undercover errands for Hubbard whenever Hubbard needed it. And Annie was one of the original Commodore's messengers, making her fanatically devoted to LRH. You know how I like my pants buttoned. (laughs) Yes, indeed. And so when Hubbard went underground in 1980, Pat and Annie were rightly positioned to take the helm because, of course, L. Ron Hubbard could only hand things over to people he trusted. And David Miscavige was likewise rightly positioned to help Pat and Annie Mm. at the highest levels. And these are all kids. They're all in their fucking 20s. Yeah. Wow. Now, Mary Sue Hubbard was the head of the Guardian's office, which was the arm of Scientology responsible for infiltrating the IRS. Basically, the Guardian's office is Scientology's version of the KGB. They're responsible mm. for attacking suppressive persons. And they got all the lawyers in there. Mm. Got you. Ms. Kavich, meanwhile, had been put fully in charge of the Commodore's messenger service at the age of 19. Little wow. Nazi. Yeah, it makes sense because the Commodore's message service is all teenagers, it's all yeah. kids. But in my estimation, the CM, or excuse me, Commodore's message organization. And in my estimation, the CMO is more Scientology's secret police. It's their Gestapo. It's if the Nazi Gestapo was run by the Hitler Youth. Mm-hmm. Well, it's also during this time period, it would change. David Miscavige will obviously change all of these structures. Yeah. But this was this served as a pseudo Gestapo. Yeah. yeah. I don't know why they call him Gestapo. Because you, you they keep going. They keep going. No, no. I. You guys don't remember that. Gestapo. I don't know why they call him Gestapo. I haven't seen him stop yet. <laughs> oh, yeah, be sure, sure. Remember so, that from what? Round Do you table. Re- I said that on round table. Years ago? <laughs> Probably like 10 years ago. Oh, wow. You don't remember Dude, that? Two years ago, one line out of I the remember a lot. I remember of hours a lot that we recorded together. Ago. Yeah. Just stop. Gestapo. I haven't seen him stop yet. I don't know why they call him Gestapo. <laughs> I haven't seen him stop yet. I feel like someone's going to say, like, that was, like, from an old musical. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> That's the thing is that. David Miscavige, he's in charge of the Commodore's Messengers organization. He has half the power that he needs. And at this point, the Guardian's office, Scientology's KGB, they're somewhat in disarray. Operation Snow White had come crashing down because a Scientologist had turned informant. Uh-oh. So trust was at an all-time low. David Miscavige saw this crisis of confidence in the old guard as an opportunity. And he set about gaining control of the Guardian's office as a fresh face. 
Oh, what a fresh face he is. He is. He looks like he's made fifth place at a Rod Stewart lookalike competition. <laughs> Just because of the height. <laughs> and at the same time, Miss Cavich also took on the role of chairman of the board of Author Services. I think it was Author Services International. I think. Yeah, I think I was international. They just put shit at the end. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. They just yeah. uh, they the long titles. Yeah. Well, Author Services was a money laundering operation whose purpose was to skim money out of the top of Scientology proper and funnel it directly to L. Ron Hubbard, oh. disguising the cash from the religion as book royalties from L. Ron's prodigious literary output. David Miscavige <laughs> begins this process of understanding of how to double your money, which is what you do is that you take money that people buy. So they're buying in-house material from the Scientology store. They're buying his material from you, so you get that money. But then what you do is you take all that money, and normally you'd have to divide it up for taxes and blah, blah, blah. He then takes a chunk of that money and says, no, 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 this old is actually, this is something else, yeah. and I'm going to stick that money back into another side of the corporation and just give it to LRH. But even though LRH is... He doesn't have money. You know, he would have he, been legal. He's if, just walking it, around. It would have been legal if L. Ron uh, Hubbard just said he was running for Congress. B basically. Yeah. yeah, I'm fine. Just allocate the funds right over there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, this basically put David Miscavige in prime positions of both the financial and authoritative wings of Scientology, all at the age of 23. Wow. And this, of course, meant that he was now in Hubbard's inner circle with Pat and Annie Broker. He made it to the yoke. He mm -hmm. did it. And once Miscavige had Elrond's ear, he began eliminating potential rivals by worm tongue and Hubbard into believing that once trusted Scientologists were taking advantage of the chaos to steal from the church. And I do mm. think he liked the fact that a young member yeah. that was, we talk about this a lot, that he saw the violence in David Miscavige and he was just like, I like this. I like the fact that you can be the hammer that I can't be anymore. Mm -hmm. And there was something about having that young energy, I think, sure. talking to him, he feels like he's kind of, he's like, yeah, 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 yeah. And like getting all pumped up from David Miscavige, and then he's just like, yeah, you go do it. Do whatever you want, David. I mean, yeah. I can see David Miscavige doing a pretty good pump-up speech, to be honest. He, oh, he does. If he turned his powers for good, he could have been a great head coach. He is not as good as a talker as LRH ever was. I was watching the only real, like, interview with him with Ted Koppel. Yeah. And he's, he's stumbly. He's actually kind of like... He, he back and forth. If he's feeling confident, he feels good. But a lot of times, he just says a lot of curse words and slaps I think people. he does good on a big stage, though, because <laughs> I did watch yeah. him present. Uh, I forget what it was for. Well, it was for the tax exempt status. Like yeah, I, when he, he gave, finally, yeah, yeah, he gave some large presentation about five or six years ago. Do you guys yeah. remember that? Yeah, oh, yeah. That. He, said, and, he just and did was, a new one. Yeah, in a yeah. grandiose sense, I think he can speak okay. When he's talking to Scientologists, he knows exactly. When he's talking to people who will not question him in any way whatsoever, he's then great. He's amazing. Yeah. Wow, what a shot. <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing. I'm so charming with no one questions me. Yeah. And he's, I mean, that's the thing is that David Miscavige has this incredibly manic energy. And I think, Henry, I think you're right. It definitely rubbed off on L. Ron Hubbard. He's like, yeah, all right. Yeah. Because mm. this is also about the time that the first, like, punishments really started in Scientology. Well, at least punishments had always been a thing in Scientology, but this is when punishments became torture. They really were way more about, it was more homework because yeah. LRH believed in the idea of you reward for positive, you punish for negative. So you give people gifts when they do well, when they are, they do, when they fail something, you punish them. And it did begin with like, well, you need more MU hours. You need these other things. You need to be audited more. You need to do any sort of this homework. But David Miscavige started being like, what if we just beat the shit out of them? Yeah. Like, mm. This is partly how Scientology's infamous running program began. See, Miscavige had a rival from New Zealand named David Mayo. And Miscavige convinced Hubbard that Mayo was stealing from Scientology's money laundering operation, the ASI. He's laundering from the money laundering <laughs> operation! No, you that's can't more money. In a launder. Wow, double launder. So Hubbard supposedly gave an order that forced Mayo to run circles around an old oak tree all day and all night <laughs> with only short breaks for food and water. This is what I'm talking about with weird shit. So you're yeah. learning here. You're learning yeah. as you're running in a circle, just being like, this is keeping you focused. Yeah. It's like a more perverted road to wellness, what the Kellogg family True. used to do. Yeah. I mean, and that's to say, I say Hubbard supposedly gave the order because Miss Cavage came out and said, Hubbard, Elrond told you to do this. So okay. we don't really know. This is at this point, we don't know what's actually coming from Hubbard okay. and what's actually coming from David because the he start David is really starting to tighten up the communication between Hubbard and everyone else. I mean, if you do have an enemy, the idea of making him just run in a circle around a tree 24 hours a day would yeah. be pretty fun. Yeah. And eventually this 
punishment became more widely used. The oak tree was replaced with a palm tree and the dirt path was replaced with a gravel track. They formalized it. But today, the running program was remarketed not as a punishment, but as a class. It's called the caused resurgence rundown and Scientologists pay upwards of five thousand dollars to do what was once a punishment why yep. aren't they winning marathons because i haven't heard one uh, because marathons aren't in a circle no yeah oh, again, it's, it's not about just in a it's circle. just in a circle it's just you're just running circles around a palm tree and you pay five thousand dollars for it and guess what wow. if you do it too fast you get punished if you get it too <laughs> slow you get punished and they, they it's so it's just it's kind of ingenious mm -hmm. turn it into a class now mm -hmm. you're paying to be punished yep. i mean what if you just went you could run 24 point some miles well, in what a they do circle, is, I well, guess. What they do is they have all these side classes because then you've been called, I believe it's called the super literate. And mm -hmm. then if you become super literate, it means you've taken all the side quests. You're trying to get 100% on the game. Yeah. Oh, wow. Now, by the early 80s, Miskovich and the brokers had tightened communications with LRH to the point where they were actually able to prevent Hubbard's own wife from contacting him. Mm. Mary Sue Hubbard, in turn, referred to Miskovich as... Little Napoleon. Because oh, if you'll it. remember, David M Miskovich is five foot three. But isn't he then just Napoleon? But that's the thing. Calling someone Little Napoleon is worse because that's the other thing. Napoleon that, was five foot seven yeah. at normal height. <laughs> <laughs> and men are. Yeah. Well, normal height for a, a French person. I for way men, back in the day. For many men. <laughs> yeah, for a they French person in, in the 1800s. For many <laughs> different eras of men. Yeah. <laughs> I'd be huge in Mongolia in 1700s. <laughs> yeah. They'd be like, whoa, look at that. Who's that? Is he a professional basketball player? What's basketball? He's towering <laughs> over me. He's like an inch taller. Eventually, <laughs> Hubbard also decided that Mary Sue needed to become a sort of sacrificial lamb. Yeah, I could see that. Yeah, LRH, right. he starts jettisoning she fucking, people. fucking going, oh, well, uh, saying all this fucking She's shit. She's his wife. Yeah. Hey, man, shouldn't have fucking... Been dumb. To be fair, she shouldn't have married him. Hey, hey, someone's got to love these idea men. I guess so. Well, LRH allegedly directed Miss Cabbage to get Mary Sue to confess to murders committed <laughs> by the Guardian's office and to do it on tape. And LRH, we go, okay, we get her on tape. Then we can turn it over to the government and then everything can be dumped on Mary Sue and I can settle into an old age with no jail time. That's, That's like, called real life insurance. Yep. Yeah, That's <laughs> one way to get rid of your wife, I guess. But with Hubbard definitively turning on Mary Sue, Miss Cavich was able to purge the Guardian's office of anyone loyal to Mary Sue, which mm. put Miss Cavich fully in control of Scientology's authoritative wing. Piece he has the Guardian's by piece office. Piece by piece. Yeah, just every little bit. And then wow. from there, Miss Cavich restructured the corporate architecture of Scientology to place more of it under his own control without anyone really noticing, at least at first. Step number one, all these door frames, they're going to be five foot seven from now on. <laughs> I want to feel like you Gandalf kneel. when I walk in here. Yeah, I want you to fucking kneel. And Miss Cavich framed it in such a way that he, what he said, the reason why I'm doing all this is that if we take L. Ron Hubbard out of the corporate structure, we take him out of the reach of the law. He can't be litigated if he's not a part of the Scientology corporate structure. We do, the old, we do it the old fashioned way where we have a he's the fancy king. Mm -hmm. Right. And so, yes, he's there and he's our inspiration. But I'm the prime minister. Yeah. Mm. And to keep Hubbard out of court, Miss Cavich hired a law firm that he codenamed the ex-attorneys. Ex <laughs> cool ex-attorneys. Yeah, a bunch of guys who cut this bar. <laughs> yeah, it sounds like it. Hubbard then gave Miss Cavage even more power to purge anyone in the church who was believed to have been aligned with Mary Sue Hubbard. So he's getting rid of uh -oh. everybody. Okay. Some of these people have been with Hubbard since the beginning of Sea Org. Decades passed. Wow. Yeah. But Whatever. Yeah. Boring. Yeah. Miss Cavage relegated all of them to cleaning duty. That that was the big thing in the day is that you got your if you're on cleaning duty, you're bottom of the barrel. You oh just my. guess who just pulled lawn duty? Mm -hmm. No, <laughs> I don't want that Ben Stiller's character from Happy Gilmore. <laughs> no. Why? Well, I, I would just leave at that point. What are they in their 40s and 50s? Yeah. Too late, I'm man. fucking going to be cleaning. You kind of maybe just sit like, oh, this will be a phase. LRH is supposed to be right this now. This is a test. Well, because mm -hmm. truthfully, he's been totally isolated and everybody else has been fed the line. LRH is in his thought laboratory <laughs> coming up with the next wave of tech, right? He's yeah. in there. That's the reason why yeah. he's not talking. It's not because he's dementia laden and kind of embarrassing himself and becoming a parody of an old man. He's doing all that. No, it's like, no, he's there and he's formulating. He's traveling yeah. the stars with his yeah. mind. 
I mean, basically what Miskovich is doing is he's just taken down the number of people who might have challenged his claim to the mm. throne. Like, and it's, and L. Ron Hubbard is, um, he is not realizing that he's doing it, but he's giving him permission to do it. Well, yeah, that's why when you're the older brother, if you play Crusader Kings 3, you always kill the babies. Yeah. Always. <laughs> I just, I don't you know. You do. You kill the babies in that. You get, it's about like building family dynasties and stuff. So you have to make sure the right son becomes a leader of the, your group. Yeah. Right. Well, yeah. What Miss Cavage did is he didn't kill the babies. He made friends with the babies. He mm. killed the fathers. He killed the uncles. Mm. Good for babies. That lucky babies. <laughs> no dad. No, around this time, 1983. Other Scientologists were beginning to notice the only people who ever talked to LRH were these three kids, Pat and Annie Broker and David Miscavige, because hmm. almost everyone from the old days had been purged from contact. When a Scientologist named Gail Irwin confronted David Miscavige about this, he allegedly knocked her to the ground with a flying tackle. Yeah, man. Jesus. I mean, that's how a five foot three man takes I you know, down. You no, know, you got to go all in. Yeah, you you got to jump it. off a of surface. Yeah. 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 God damn it, man. When she complained and demanded a meeting with Pat Broker in a Denny's parking lot, it was David Miscavige. Oh, moon's over my fucking hammy. <laughs> yeah, That's do. what we're fucking doing. Oh, let's go well, get a fucking yeah. grand slam, bitch. That is what we focus on, and yeah. I do love the human element of this. <laughs> meet me in the Denny's parking you lot. You meet me in the Denny's parking lot <laughs> right now. Well, she tried getting a hold of Pat Broker, but she got Pat David Miscavige instead. Oh, I pick up phones. No. Yeah. As Gail Irwin was waiting. Just see David Miscavige carbo loading with a bunch of pancakes. <laughs> Slamming pancakes and <laughs> sa, sa, sa. As Gail Irwin was waiting, a black van skidded in the parking lot and David Miscavige with five other dudes climbed out. Get her, boys. Oh, no. <laughs> Using a tire iron, Miscavige walked up to the payphone that Gail was supposed to be talking to Pat on and he smashed it with it. You he think a fucking room <laughs> oh would not God. destroy a telephone fucking booth? Yeah. So she realized that Miscavige knew what she was up to. Yeah. Yep. And then Miscavige ordered her into the van. Oh, no. She wasn't hurt. But she was declared an SP, which to a Scientologist is worse. Yeah, you would rather be, have the shit beat out of you than be declared an SP. Everything right. has been stripped of you and you're out. And then mm -hmm. they have the, the it's got fair game, which, is, which will come into play. And then you just get cut off. Now. Right from your grave. Now, by this point, no one knew what messages were actually coming from LRH and which ones were coming from Miss Cavage and the brokers. Because Miss Cavage isn't the only one still in contact with LRH. Mm. There's also Pat and Annie Broker. There's basically three people that right. are in contact with him right now. But this confusion and anger about what's coming from LRH and what's not, that eventually resulted in protests at Scientology conventions held in 1982. Nice. But Miss Cavage and his minions verbally declared that all of the protesters were SPs, whereas before such a declaration had to come from formally written orders. Wow. Miscavige also positioned himself to speak with LRH's voice in 1983, when Hubbard's eldest estranged son, Nibs... You remember Nibs? <laughs> yeah, Nibs, I remember yeah. Nibs. He filed a lawsuit to summon Hubbard to court so Hubbard could subsequently be served with a slew of civil cases relating to Scientological misdeeds. All I'm of a sorry. sudden, I, was, I wish I could be there. I wish. But I'm on Saturn right now. <laughs> yes. Just leave a message. I'm sorry, Mr. Nibs. We don't take lawsuits from little pieces of licorice. <laughs> My name is Nibs! <laughs> yes. Sound like a little candy. <laughs> Well, to avoid court, Miss Cavish had the ex attorneys <gasps> hire experts to manufacture a special batch of ink that could be dated with certainty. <gasps> Ms. Cavage then had Hubbard sign a declaration saying he was okay and alive using this special ink. Then Ms. Cavage had an expert testify in court saying that Elron's signature using this ink was proof that he was alive, mm. thereby avoiding any need for Elrond to appear in court in person. Think about Boom. how far, think about how deep a scam that is. That's crazy. That he went and found properly aged ink that could be written down. So if they That's even crazy. tried to look at it with forensics, it would, right. it would apply. That is the type of true thorough fuckery mm -hmm. that he was capable of. And this is baby David. Like we're <laughs> yeah. not even at full grown big daddy David. Yeah. Wow. But sneakily, this signed statement also included a declaration 
that Miss Cabbage was in charge of Hubbard's affairs. Oh. This later gave Miss Cabbage leverage to declare that Hubbard had named him Scientology's successor. The most which, powerful force in the world. Leverage. <laughs> <laughs> we know the teeter-totter rules of life. <laughs> well, around this time, David Miscavige also began using more aggressive tactics in defending Scientology in the public eye. Jump kick, jump kick, <laughs> super punch, super punch. <laughs> <laughs> Most notably, he used these aggressive tactics during an event that Scientologists hyperbolically refer to as the Battle of Portland. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen that footage. See, Scientology became embroiled in two major lawsuits in 1985 that threatened mm. to murder, kill, completely remove Scientology from the face of the planet. One lawsuit claimed emotional distress caused by brainwashing and emotional abuse. Mm. The other claimed that the church had falsely asserted that they could improve the plaintiff's intelligence, creativity, and communication skills. Now, oh, yeah. what? Now, how did we know that that didn't work? Well, the thing is, I can no longer speak now. <laughs> I must come. I actually was very, very smart. I'm very stupid. I'm very stupid. <laughs> well, he, uh, LRH always said that he just using auditing alone with one auditing session, he could raise your IQ point. By one point. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that easy. Oh, wow. Yeah. I mean, basically, people are coming at him from two directions. It's like, one, like from one direction of like, like hey, we're using slave labor. Yeah. And the other direction is you're a scam. Yep. You know? Right. When the trials were all said and done, the courts were about to award a total of $69 million in nice. damages to the plaintiffs. Yeah. Which easily. Beg yes, sixty nine million. That's like, yes. that's when you that's when you eat. <laughs> she sucks your sixty nine million. That's a funny number. Nice. <laughs> you say sixty nine and anything is funny. Nice. <laughs> well, that would have easily bankrupted the church uh -huh. at the time. Okay. Now probably not. And so in May and June of nineteen eighty five, Miss Cavage organized a protest in which twelve thousand Scientologists, Ooh. including John Travolta, descended upon Portland. This is when John Travolta came out for the first time and openly said, I am a Scientologist. Scientology has helped me. I have helped other people with Scientology. But of course, this is also long after John Travolta was still a big star, a bankable star. John, okay, you're coming out. Yeah, it's me. What? This is great. So you're coming out. <laughs> no, Any, no. I just, uh, hey, oh, Mr. Connor, I'm just leaving my house. <laughs> That's great. That was uh, 10 years ago. I haven't been inside. I took all the doors up with closets 10 years ago, Mr. Connor. <laughs> this is great, though. So you're coming out. You're a Scientologist. You want to come out about anything? I'm just putting on shoes and putting my pants. I'm going outside my house. That's the only thing I'm coming out of. No, Mr. Connor. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I mean, he came out. This is around 1985. So he was about five years past Urban Cowboy. But this was the year that he was in Perfect with Jamie Lee Curtis. And she's uh, good. She looks good. She one. looks amazing in that one. But he's still also seven years from Look Who's Talking and Look Who's Talking Too. And don't even get me started on Look Who's Talking Now. <laughs> hey, wow. <laughs> I didn't want to get you now. started on any of that. <laughs> but these people, these 12,000 protesters. That's they, a, but that is really is remarkable. That's incredible. 12,000 people. Yeah. They created enough of a ruckus where the judge declared a mistrial in one case and the church reached a settlement for an undisclosed amount mm. in the other. From this, Miss Cavage learned that intimidation works. So the judge literally was like, let's go with mob rule. He basically, just yeah. like, all right, okay, okay, okay. Sounds like a big old hassle. <laughs> it's a little <laughs> more complicated than that, but it, it breaks down to basically, yeah, he intimidated his way out of these, uh, and he saved, basically saved the church. All know? right, well, he does get to be the head of it then, doesn't he? Well, by 1986, Miss Cavage, Annie Broker, and Pat Broker, they were pretty much the only ones in contact with LRH. And on January 16th of that year, Hubbard suffered a stroke and died on a bus eight days later. Um, I'm hey, not even at sea. Hey, he discarded his vessel <laughs> because he had more space homework that he had to do. I just mm -hmm. feel like he should have died on a boat. I mean, he wanted that too. He, he wanted that too. Bus. He did not want to die on a, a bus. I don't want to die on a bus. No, he called it, it was the Bluebird. It was the Bluebird. It's yeah. a bus. <laughs> he didn't want to be there either. He loved no. his boat. He missed so it. So he died in yeah. a bus named after a plane, but all he wanted was a boat. That's mm -hmm. how life goes. <laughs> Sad. You die with whatever you're in. Mm -hmm. I guess so. But just before LRH died, he issued something called Flag Order 3879. In this order, called... Was, okay, hold on. Was there any Flag Order 3876? Who knows? Yeah. Did he just magically pull that number out because it sounds There's cool? There's definitely forms. Yeah, it might have been three. There might have been three thousand eight hundred and seventy-eight before that. There could have been. Okay. Well, in this order, called the Sea Org in the future, 
Hubbard retired the rank of Commodore and promoted himself to Admiral. Hey, congrats. Sweet. More importantly, though, he instituted a new rank, that of loyal officer. But instead of appointing David Miscavige to this new rank, LRH appointed Pat and Annie Broker, Mm. which made it somewhat obvious to most Scientologists that the torch was being passed to them. Oh. Miscavige, of course, didn't agree. Yeah. That wasn't in his plans. Oh, Mm -hmm. I see. He didn't know that. Yeah. Yeah. But before that fight happened, the church had to explain LRH's death to the church. Because remember, Scientology is supposed to fix everything, including strokes. And if LRH Mm. couldn't figure it out, then what chance did the rest of them have? Right. So Broker and Miss Cavage came up with a plan together. They decided the LRH did not actually die. Oh, mm-hmm. instead, look at that. he quote dropped his body. Hey man, awesome. he's busy, dog. His yeah. hands are full, man. Yeah, get yeah. rid of it. Dropped his body so he could move to a higher level of existence. Hit me with that, dog. Yeah, <laughs> G sure. me up with that. Yeah. Sure. And this was announced by David Miscavige himself at a gathering of two thousand Scientologists. Days after Hubbard's death. You can almost hear the crowd now be like, oh, that's Chuggy. Yeah. <laughs> oh, ooh, is that a thing? Still? I don't know. No. Uh, but they, I remember when he died, they said that they all applauded. Everybody with him and the brokers were like, yes, we did it. Because <laughs> wow. they were trying to frame it like it's positive. But they mm-hmm. also they were like, no. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, it well, wasn't at the Hollywood Bowl where he announced it, but it was something like that. Yeah, it, was it was like the, the Hollywood Palladium. Palladium. The Palladium, yeah, wow. he announced it there. All right, so they were celebrating the death of their dear leader. Yeah. Now, for most t- Scientologists, when they saw David Miscavige on stage announcing all this wacky shit, that was the first time they'd ever seen or even heard of David Miscavige. It must have been funny, too, because they got to bring out the little step, like when Robert Reich <laughs> speaks, uh, and he, then you have to bring out the little thing. They do have that. I know he they He does have a little stool that he <laughs> to use, and he also he refuses lifts. Because he says that's TC's thing. TC? Tom Cruise. Tom Cruise. I TC. figured that TC. one out. Oh, yeah. Yeah. But when Miss Cabbage said that Hubbard had reached the level in which the body is nothing more than an impediment, <laughs> the people <laughs> listened. Oh. Uh, up next at the memorial service was Pat Broker, who had big news to deliver to the congregation to soften the blow of Hubbard's death. Okay. He said that Hubbard had made significant breakthroughs in his research just before he dropped his body. Great. To wit, Hubbard had discovered two more levels on the bridge to total freedom. You wouldn't oh even believe God. it. Oh, you my God. It. And he had notes for three after that. Uh-huh. Wow, I can't. Whoa, yep. more yeah. levels of this pyramid scheme. Mm-hmm. Hey. <laughs> hey. <laughs> now, the bridge to total freedom is a list of auditing actions that are needed to reach the highest OT level. The OT level is the operating Thetan level, which one can only progress through once one has become clear. It's the work after the work after you've done all the work. Yeah, and each <sighs> operating Thetan level reveals uh-huh. new knowledge. Like you learn about the Xenu mythology after OT3 of 8, when it's far too late to turn back. The but wall that's of it fire, still, right? It, it yeah. still ends with Xenu, or do they add another one? No, oh, there's, no, there's, there's five more after Xenu. After Xenu? After oh, Xenu, yeah. there's five more. Oh, mama. And if any of this sounds confusing, then perhaps you merchants of chaos need to stop nattering your miss emotionals. I'd recommend taking a guck bomb to straight wire your purif into a floodless audit. Elsewise, you clams might be brought up to the commev at Cedars to blow down your interbulations. Yeah, and you want some more clam speak for hubborgs, right? Because the thing is, we get mm-hmm. you as raw meat, sure, and we run you up to present time. As long as you're in ethics, you're going to have to deal with it. But if you're getting rock slammed and you're run down because you're a J&D and you've been t- and that's getting ticked on your KR and your oh. MUNs are piling up, you don't jump out gradient. you got to stick to your SOS and you got to be the spokes clam you want to be not the squirrel your thetans thought taught you to be so don't blame me for blows or you'll be spending your summer getting your goddamn trs in <laughs> all right there we go i want to be the spokes clam i can be yeah not the squirrel your thetans want you to be. no absolutely not who would i would rather well theoretically well we've learned nothing no <laughs> it's more fun to be a squirrel than that took a clam. Me like two hours to put together that sentence. <laughs> it's really good what does it mean <laughs> I mean, I got the gist of it. That's all you need to do. Yeah, that's all. That's all it is. That's it. It means all, they're all the words that mean nothing. Ah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Basically, I said like, if all of you people who don't like Scientology, you need to stop fucking up all the things. I don't know. Great. Yeah. I, yeah. All right. You nailed it. I actually do understand mine, but you have yeah. to let yeah. the audience do it. I, I, under, it. I, I understand it. it, but I couldn't explain it. Does that make sense? I understand, but that's I can't. Explain welcome it. to Scientology. Welcome to Scientology. <laughs> Well, really, all you need to know about the OT levels for the purposes of this story is that there always have been and always will be only eight OT levels. Okay. 
But at L. Ron Hubbard's memorial service, you suddenly got Pat Broker saying, nah, man, there's two more That's OT levels. Cool. And he actually held up what was supposed to be a page detailing OT10. You see this wow, page that yes. none of you can read from the stage? Yeah. You're going to all love it. <laughs> wow, that's chuggy. That's chuggy. <laughs> this was, of course, a ploy to position himself as the new leader of Scientology because he who holds the tech in Scientology holds the power. Oh. Or... That's what Broker so naively believed. <laughs> that's what that's what Musk thought when he bought Twitter. Mm-hmm. And then he's like, why am I not getting more imprints on my dreams? Exactly. Well, this may have been true in Hubbard's day, that he who holds the tech holds the power. Sure. But what Broker didn't realize was that Miss Cavich had already changed the game. See, Miss Cavich was a man of the 80s oh, yeah. who had long since understood that he who holds the corporate structure mm. holds the power. And when it came to structure, Miss Cavich had a hell of a lot more power than Pat Broker. By this point, Miss Cavich had his minions in the financial wing of the ACI. He had most of the Guardian's office and nearly all of the Commodore's messenger service. And that's not even to mention the ex attorneys. Yeah, like Wolverine. <laughs> yeah, cool. <laughs> Pat- Wolverine Rabinowitz. <laughs> Also, Wolverine is 5'3". Yes. yes. Interesting. Yeah. Very interesting indeed. Yes. Sure, yeah. <laughs> indeed. Miss Cavage, the Wolverine of cult leaders. Yeah, he is. Yeah, I'd put him there. I could see him yeah. going berserk. Yeah. Pat Broker, meanwhile, he had none of this. He only had mysterious pages that no one had actually seen detailing new OT levels. And he had a claim that he was in telepathic communication with LRH from beyond the grave. That's just a claim. He's just (laughs) saying stuff. He's just saying, he's saying, I've been telepathic. Well, not from beyond the grave because, of course, LRH is not dead. He's telepathically communicating to Elon Hubbard's spirit. Great. Yeah. The only real world card that Pat Broker had was that his wife was in charge of the Religious Technology Center. But again, the RTC was mostly about the tech, not the structure. Mm. And by 1987, Miscavige had seized control of that as well. No romance, no adventure. Mm -mm. He understood that it's like it's played out already. All of the genuine, quote unquote, whatever you'd call the intentions of LRH, all of the magical properties, everything we've learned from the LRH series, the Jack Parson series, all of that work of the ritual magic, but like boiled into this system, he said, fuck that. Yeah. No. It's all about who controls the wallet. <laughs> wow. So he really made it just corporate. Yeah. Yeah. Less oh, fun. Can you believe Sounds that? Less oh. fun. Yeah. But there was still the matter of Flag Order 3879, which named the brokers, not David Miscavige, as loyal officers. Mm-hmm. So Miscavige took L. Ron Hubbard's advice and went on the attack. Never defend, always attack. See, Pat Broker had taken up residence at the ranch where L. Ron Hubbard had died. And from there, Pat figured that he could direct Scientology from afar. But Pat being isolated meant that Miss Cavage could spread rumors. Mm-hmm. Specifically, Miss Cavage said that Pat was a drunk <gasps> who spent all of his time traveling the country buying exotic animals for the ranch. Again, <laughs> it's fucking weird. He's it's just such a saying weird, shit. It's just a, such a weird all thing right. to say about somebody. And it sticks, though. Yeah, it He just sticks. accused him of being Tiger King. Yeah. Yep. So, with Broker's reputation tarnished, Miss Cavage gathered his most trusted allies, which included future defectors Mike Rinder and Marty Rathbun. Mm. Together, this group stormed Broker's Ranch to find and remove the only small piece of power Pat had left, the new OT levels. With an actual goon squad surrounding the ranch, all of them with walkie-talkies, ready to rush in. With any luck, it's our Waco. <laughs> <laughs> well, in his way, too, it's like, because it shows his naivete kind of in a way, too, thinking that all of this was real. Yeah. Like uh, like he has the secret papers of Seriously. L. Ron Hubbard, where it's like, you know that he doesn't. Yeah. Or you just write other papers. He's mm-hmm. written a lot of papers. <laughs> <laughs> well, Miss Cavage entered Pat's house and tore out the walls in search of the OT levels. What he found, though, was far better, especially considering how the new OT levels didn't actually exist. Right. Instead, David Miscavige found bags of previously unaccounted for cash (laughs) in the walls. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) Mystery cash. Oh, yeah. Where'd that come from? Oh, Oh. man. I would call the contractor. (laughs) (laughs) You left all this cash. Mr. Contractor, you left your money behind. Oh, God. Why'd you do that? And all Miss Cavage had to do to get rid of broker forever is turn over that untaxed cash to the IRS. Yeah, they always get their man. Oh, mm-hmm. my goodness. And with that, Miss Cavage reached the end game. Broker had two choices either turn complete control of the church over to Miss Cavage or go to jail. He chose the former. 
And of course, Miss Cabbage, who couldn't let anything go, who's extremely vindictive, he added insult to injury by separating Pat from his wife. Yeah, he destroyed their relationship. He mm. then convinced Annie Broker that she had been a victim of her husband this entire time. And after she finally agreed, she was relegated to a heavily monitored low authority position by the middle of 1987. Oh, my and God. So, and so, with all of his rivals out of the way, David Miscavige took full charge of Scientology. That, of course, is where we'll pick back up Whoa. next week when the bad times truly begin. Bad they just times. started, man. He hasn't even begun, dog. <laughs> what are you t- bad times? The walls are flush with cash. <laughs> wow. Wow. Just because you know, that's the thing. Just to have some of that determination, just a little bit of that miscavige like energy oh, would be so nice. We have a little bit of it. That's why I, we're, yeah. we're doing okay in our business. I know. Just he's so, he's just you so want, vigorous. I would go 10% miscavige energy and yeah, then. Uh, just can, a little bit. I want to bottle a little bit. Put it in a, co- a cologne. Mm-hmm. Like, that'd be nice. Yeah, yeah, I like don't want musk. the smell of it, to be honest. Yeah. He might uh, smell so good. This guy, I think he smells robust. Yeah. I'm sure he smells a floral Like a scent. woody, a woody. Yeah. So I guarantee you, you know when he comes into the room first with your nose. Mm. You sure? Mm, yes. Yeah. But uh, anyway, all right, David Miscavige. Well, wow. that's just the beginning of how he began the process of being the monster he is now. He is, mm-hmm. and we feel like we'll come crap. back. We're going to talk about celebrities. We're going to get into it. Like, we're very excited for this update because it get, it's still going. They just served Davis Miscavige. Today. They finally got him today. Yeah. So we'll see what happens because they're still going after him, shipping a bunch of slave labor to Australia. He's up to his same old tricks that he always was. Well, yep. it's and, a thing, and he's still trying to do that L. Ron Hubbard shit if they can't, saying, like, if they can't get me in the court, they can't get me on anything. Right. And today the judge actually ruled, like, we've been trying to serve you for a year. Who gives a shit? We're going for it. Yeah, we're we going to get ha- you. Yeah, we don't have to serve you. You're just fucking avoiding it. Yeah, well, we're going to we'll get see you. what happens. Well, speaking of shipping to Australia, we'll be there in August. Yeah, yeah we'll be there Can't August uh, 2nd through the 10th. Should I go through the list? Or nah, we're just going to go last podcast you know on the left. Go last podcast on the left.com. Take a look at all of our dates yes. in Australia. It's the first week of August. We can't wait to fucking see you. It's going to be great. Um, uh, we're going to do we a live some, yeah. side story to the Fine Arts Theater in Beverly Hills, April 8th. Uh, I got those tickets up on my socials. We'll put it up on the last podcast socials as well. Uh, oh, and, and we're also going to New Zealand too, not just Australia. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. We're starting in Auckland. Yeah, we're right? rocking yeah. and reeling in Auckland, New Zealand. And there's man. a we're power vacuum. We, we might become leaders. That's the finally. <laughs> you guys want? You guys want some new presidentes? Yeah, let's, sure. All let's right. Let's do it. Well, listen, just hear me out. All right. Corrective spanks for the government. <laughs> Everybody in the government gets make them one aroused? stern spank. Oh, yeah. I thought you meant corrective spanks as in like you get like some spanks like the pants. No, no. Oh. Paddles and right. hands. Yeah. OK. Paddles and hands. All right. <laughs> they both work. All right, everyone. Thank you for listening. Hail yourselves. Hail Satan. Hail again. My gosh, delations. And then. Uh, and, but do your reading. Do your reading. I don't want you fucking coming up in the next fucking episode explaining to me, the, saying to me, you don't understand the glossary terms, okay? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Because they are out there for you to read, and it's on you to catch up to us, yeah. okay? Yeah, you yeah. don't want us interbulated. You don't well, want us interbulated. Soon that'll be the only book that schools are allowed to have in their library. Whoa, <laughs> commentary. <laughs> <laughs> This show is made possible by listeners like you. Thanks to our ad sponsors. You can support our shows by supporting them. For more shows like the one you just listened to, go to lastpodcastnetwork.com.